Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Samir Mathu with us. Uh, he's from Ohio State University, USA. Uh, a lot of people know uh, about Samir's expertise area, but for students and those who are completely new, for them, I just want to introduce him uh, like uh, in short. So it's like he's an expert on the area of quantum gravity and string theory. Mostly he works on black hole physics. Um, he did his uh, masters from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Then he was a PhD student and a postdoc student at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Then he was uh, a postdoc from Harvard University. Then he had joined as a junior faculty at MIT. And then uh, later he joined Ohio State University and he's continuing uh, uh, as a professor. Um, he, uh, today he's going to talk about a very interesting topic where he had done a lot of uh, good work in this area. He will talk about black hole information paradox, a, a simple introduction, and we are very hopeful that we can able to learn a lot of uh, interesting stuff from him. And uh, uh, thank you, Professor Mathur, for agreeing to give uh, the talk for this QASTM uh, forum. This is the 48th uh, series in this talk, and uh, we all are welcoming you from Potsdam. Uh, you can start. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, I think this is a wonderful set of uh, lectures to have because if you have lectures that are not confined to a given time, like one hour and people can stop and ask questions and go slowly, then I think students really learn a lot. So I would actually encourage everybody to stop me and clarify things as we go along because that is useful for you, but also very much for me so that I can keep track of what people are understanding. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is, see if I can advance the slide. So we all know that general relativity tells us that if you have a large amount of mass, like maybe a big ball of dust, then it will collapse under its own gravity and it will make a black hole. So this is a prediction of general relativity and has been known for quite some time. But in 1975, Hawking found a rather puzzling thing. He said that once you make a black hole, then if you do quantum mechanics around the black hole, then quantum mechanics will be found to be inconsistent. So this is known as the black hole information paradox. And you can see why it is so serious, because general relativity is one of the two big pillars of modern physics. And we see it quite well confirmed in the sky, and in cosmology, and with stars, and so on. But quantum mechanics is also another big pillar of modern physics. And if these two, when you try to put them together, there is some inconsistency, then obviously it's a very serious problem. Uh, we have to resolve this inconsistency. We don't actually have a choice. So in fact, in uh, some uh, 20 years ago, they tried to list out the top 10 problems for the new millennium. And uh, one of those problems was, what is the resolution of this paradox? So clearly there is something here that we need to understand. So in fact, what has been happening with this paradox is rather puzzling. You must have been reading in the papers about it now and then. There are some comments about you know, people found this or they argued this. And the, to see how confusing the situation is, I just want to remind you that long ago, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne, they together took a bet with John Prescott. These are all well-known physicists. You might have heard about uh, most of these people. Uh, so Hawking and Thorne were saying that in black holes, information is lost. And John Preskill was saying, well, I don't know how it will be, the problem will be solved, but ultimately I think it will not be lost. And so this bet was going on for a while. And then in 2004, Stephen Hawking surrendered his bet to John Preskill. Uh, in paying off the bet, he sent him a volume of encyclopedias. That was the bet. And uh, said, okay, I surrender. I think the information uh, will not be lost in black holes and quantum mechanics will be consistent. But the co-signer on the bet, Kip Thorne, 
He said, but I don't agree. The arguments you have given make no sense to me and you haven't proved anything. So somehow, even after everybody has sort of had their say on the problem, nothing seems to be clear. So really what is going on? What are all the uh, ins and outs of this problem? And why is it so confusing? We want to understand all that today. Okay, so let us make a first pass at this puzzle and see what kind of things are leading to these difficulties. And the issue is really very basic and it has to do with the fact that gravity is an attractive force. And once you have that, all the problems actually follow right from there. So on this screen, you can see I have just placed one heavy mass here, which I have called capital M. And I have put a test mass here, which I have called little m. And they are at some distance apart, which I have called r. Then in just Newtonian gravity, you know that the potential energy between them is minus g, the first mass, second mass, divided by the distance. Let us now also put in things which we otherwise know beyond Newtonian mechanics. If you look at this small mass by itself, it has an intrinsic energy, which is equal to mc squared. Okay, so this mass itself has energy mc squared. So if it is sitting by itself in some faraway place, its energy is mc squared. But if you keep it near this mass, capital M, then of course there's a negative PE also. And so what will the total energy be? We're just working in some rough hand moving way. So let us just say the energy will be the intrinsic energy plus the potential energy. So I get some expression like this. Uh, so is there a question for me? Uh, that's not clear. Uh, I could not catch that. What happened is actually I really didn't get. Hello, you can able to hear? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, suddenly someone interrupted and something happened. I don't yes. know. Yeah, sorry for this. Okay, so should I screen share again and continue? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, since the problem already happened, I would request everyone, please uh, mute your uh, uh, like microphone and also switch off the camera. Only if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask directly. You don't need to ask me, you can ask directly and don't write anything in the chat box. That's the request. Now you can continue, Professor. Okay. So this is where we were. This mass, little m, has an intrinsic energy mc squared but also if I keep it near a mass big M, then there will be a negative gravitational potential energy. So maybe I can think of the total energy like this. The important sign is this minus sign, and that is what tells us that gravity has an, is an attractive force. But you can see the consequence of this minus mm -hmm. sign, and the consequence is as follows. You see that as you make R smaller and smaller, the negative part becomes you know, larger in magnitude, and at some r, you can see the total energy will become zero. So at this particular value, this word negative should be zero, total energy becomes zero when r is equal to gm over c square. And if I make r even smaller, then the total energy is net negative. So that is very funny because now you see, of course you should do all this properly with general relativity because once you have already included E equals mc square, which is special relativity, and you're also talking about gravity, because we are using minus gmm over r, when you mix gravity and relativity, you get general relativity. 
So you might already object at this point and say, you should have talked properly using general relativity, but that's okay. You do the same thing with general relativity, it doesn't change much. There's only an extra factor of two, and you find that once you are inside a radius r equals to gm by c square, you can actually put a particle there, and then the mc square part of the intrinsic energy is more than compensated by the gravitational potential energy, and the net energy of that particle, as seen from infinity, is negative. So this is a funny situation, because I start with the mass capital M, and if I add something to it, put this test mass little m near that, the total thing actually has less energy than what I started with. So normally we are used to the fact that if we add something to a system, the energy goes up, but here I'm adding something and the energy is going down. And you can see it is all coming just from the negative sign of the gravitational potential, because with that, if I put two bodies close enough, it seems I can get the energy to be as negative as I want. Okay, so now why can't we keep repeating that? So we can put many particles near this heavy particle, and then we can keep reducing the total energy each time of the system, and I can bring it down to zero. Maybe you might say because of quantum gravity effects, it can't come below the Planck energy, so maybe I can bring it down to Planck mass. But anyway, value, and this is very puzzling now, because I have made a very complicated big object. I have had this initial mass, this red dot here, which could be as big as I wanted. And then I have put a lot of these little dots here, which have brought the mass down to zero. So there's an enormous amount of stuff in there with a total energy of that at zero, or maybe just the Planck mass. So we have a low mass object with a lot of internal structure. Such objects we will see are called remnants. Okay. And the problem is, as you can just see from this slide, but I will show in more detail on the next slide, you can actually make an infinite number of remnants. And that is what one thing that will create a problem for quantum mechanics. So let us see what the problems are. Why can I make an infinite number of remnants? First, there are many ways to choose the initial mass m. I could take a ball of copper, a ball of iron, I could take anything to make that big mass m. Those are all different possibilities. Then there are many ways to choose these little masses, uh, the little m's. For example, this yellow dot could be the electron, the uh, brown dots could be positrons, I can keep putting you know, electrons and positrons in equal number to make it not have any net overall charge. But there are so many ways to choose which is an electron, which is a positron. If I put n masses, there are two to the n ways to choose which one is which. And in all these cases, I will come down to a mass zero. But the uh, real thing which will uh, make this a uh, total number of possibilities, ways to make this kind of construction infinite, is that there's no limit to how big you take the initial mass. You can take it to be one solar mass, 100 solar masses, a million solar masses, and then dial the whole energy down to zero. Well, in that case, you have an infinite number of possibilities. And so particularly because of C, the number of remnants is actually infinite. So now this is very puzzling. You might say, okay, so what is wrong if you can have a big complicated object with a mass which is zero or close to zero? The problem is that in quantum theory, there is some difficulty with this, because in quantum mechanics, you know that you have what is called loop diagrams. Suppose there is a photon which is traveling, you draw it by a line like this, then the photon can break into an electron and positron pair, and then they can re annihilate and the photon continues. So this is happening all the time in normal quantum field theory, and uh, there is some probability for this, and we compute that in quantum field theory. But now, why can't you actually create one of the remnants here, and maybe an opposite remnant here, if this has positive charge, this could have negative charge, just a pair of remnants, and that's okay. They can also run in the loop. But if you have infinitely many remnants, then the total contribution of this loop to the quantum mechanical amplitude will be infinity. So in fact, any pro problem that you do in quantum field theory, if there are infinitely many particles which can appear in these loops, then every possible amplitude you calculate will be infinity. So somehow there should not be an infinite number of remnants. The problem is that the mass of these things has come down to zero. There can always be more and more particles in the theory as long as their masses keep increasing because a heavy particle does not contribute much to the loop amplitude, it is suppressed. But if you have infinite number of particles whose mass is all zero or a fixed value Planck mass, then the suppression is fixed for every one of them, but you have to multiply by the number of such possible masses, and that is an infinity, so every loop becomes infinite. So this is very worrisome, and we will see in a minute the worries are even deeper. There are even more fundamental problems with having this kind of situation, but if you look at this at this stage, how can you avoid it? 
the moment you have a negative sign for the gravitational potential, you can always cancel the MC square with a negative potential, and you can always make a zero mass for objects with a lot of internal structure. So this is our first pass at the puzzle, and ultimately, this is the root of the problem. Well, what are the proposed solutions for this? Well, let's try various possibilities. This is still our first pass. We will take more complicated looks at this later. So possibility A, the remnant which you make this way, suppose you have this uh, dot and then the heavy mass and then you cancel with all the light masses. Suppose the total thing, because it has no mass, so it has no energy by E equals MC squared. Since normally we think that this only state with no energy is the vacuum, maybe it's possible that anytime somebody tries to make an object like this, it just disappears into the vacuum. So this is one possibility. Every time you put masses close together so that the total energy becomes zero, the whole thing just disappears and you go back to the vacuum. So that's why I have written all this becomes nothing. But there is something wrong with that because there was so much information in the structure here. We said the central mass could be made of copper or iron or could be the collapse result of some star or some different kind of star. There are so many possibilities. And then there are so many ways of putting these masses around. Well, all this information which told us whether we have this state or that state or some other state, if they all just disappear and they become the vacuum, all that information will be lost. So this very simple way of looking at things is basically the information loss proposal that Hawking made in his original paper of 1974, followed by his paper of 1975. He said that when a black hole uh, will disappear, you will actually be left with nothing. And when you're left with nothing, we will see that this kind of objects which have vanished that's actually at the root of what is called the information loss paradox. So this is why it's called the information loss paradox. We have not yet seen where the black hole and all come in, but this is the root of the problem. Now, not many people accepted Hawking's idea originally because we don't just lose information in quantum mechanics. If you have one kind of state with some internal structure, it may evolve to something. If you have a different state with some different internal structure, it will evolve to something else. Because in quantum mechanics, states which are orthogonal in the Hilbert space, Hilbert space evolve to orthogonal states in the Hilbert space. That is called unitarity of quantum mechanics. Two different states can't evolve to the same state. Uh, that does not preserve unitarity. So Hawking was arguing that quantum mechanics will break down when you make black holes and so on. But not many people believed him then. And not many people would like this kind of proposal right now either. So let us see what are the other possibilities. So the other possibility is, is OK. When you keep putting these uh, uh, objects which have net negative energy and you keep lowering the mass of the entire object, you can think that the total energy comes down close to zero. But maybe once you come down to something like Planck mass, then quantum gravity effects will turn in and maybe you can't really make the mass go further down. And then you will have a lot of these Planck mass objects, maybe an infinite number of them. We cannot avoid that. But uh, we just stay there. So we have this infinite number Samir, of things. Just I, I have to uh, ask one thing. Uh, before also you have mentioned about this infinite number of remnants. So is, is it some kind of in quantum field theory, this large n limit we talked about people? No, so this does not have to do with large n. That large n is large, but still finite. Okay. So it is, and, but the way it is used is the same. That is true. Because in the large n theory, what you try to do is that you try to have very many loop amplitudes. So if the n is large, you keep making lots and lots of loops. And yeah. then when you have many loops on a surface, if the theory is a matrix kind of theory, then those loops sort of make like a surface out of themselves. And that is how you get from large n theories to string theory. Exactly. So yes, the idea there also is that by making n large, you enhance the number of loops. But then in a controlled way, where you take a large n but finite approximation, and then the bigger the n is, the larger the radius of maybe the dual ADS space or something in ADS CFT duality. But if you already made an infinity from the beginning, then you might have a problem. Okay, okay. Now I'm getting. Okay. So Thank then, uh, so yeah, so that's a very relevant question. People should please keep stopping me and asking you know questions like this or even for clarification. That is very helpful to me. Okay. So then, uh, you we might think that there might be some other way to solve the problems in quantum field theory. Maybe the remnants which are more complicated uh, have less amplitude for being produced. There are many ways to try to fix it. And so many people working in general relativity, they accept the idea that we have remnants because we can't find any other way of bypassing this problem. Okay, then the third possibility is that we find some effect in our theory of gravity that prevents us from actually putting these masses here. Suppose we really cannot come very close to this central mass which I made with the dot 
and we can't put those particles there. If we can't put those particles up in this entire region, then of course we cannot make use of the negative sign of the Gleibstein potential and we cannot actually uh, get the negative energy for the test mass that we were looking for. So we will actually find it in string theory. This is what seems to be happening. We call that the fuzzball construction and I will talk about that towards the end of the talk. We will actually find it if you take a large mass and you try to confine it to a small place in string theory, somehow it doesn't confine. A large mass always has a certain size. It fluffs up to become a big ball, which we call a fuzzball. And the size of that ball is always bigger than this radius 2gm by c square that we were talking about. We will see in a minute that that critical radius inside which these energies become negative, that is what corresponds to the horizon radius for a black hole. So we will be saying that in string theory, somehow when you try to make a black hole, you don't succeed. The mass you try to squeeze in a black hole always swells up or puffs up to become something big, something bigger than the horizon size. So you always get something like a star or a planet. And then of course there is no puzzle because you cannot get in there to put negative energy objects. So you know that if you have some solid ball like the earth, you can try to put a particle up to the surface and then the formula minus gmm over r is still valid. But if you try to go inside the uh, earth, that is no longer the correct formula because the potential energy does not increase like one by r when you go inside because only the mass uh, you know, inside the a given radius gives force and so on. So the actual potential energy reaches the finite value at the center of the earth and not minus infinity as would be suggested by minus g mm over r. So once you have a ball like this, of course you have a normal planet or star of uh, string theory of any person. So this of course has to be somewhat rather non-trivial. You cannot just say that in string theory, instead of particles, we have strings and then somehow automatically such a ball will form. It is nothing as simple as that. And the reason is that in string theory, you only get string effect at the Planck scale. So any particle like electron that you thought about, uh, maybe it's a string, but the size of the string will be size of Planck scale, which is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters. So that does not seem to obstruct anything like this, because we will soon see that the radius that we are talking about here would be like the radius of a black hole that is many kilometers and you're trying to put a small particle in there which could be like an electron so something even if it has a size like Planck length it's a string of radius Planck length it hardly seems to make any difference it has to be something much deeper and it is those deeper notions that we want to investigate okay but suppose you do not actually have this fuzzball construction which was discovered at some point in string theory but suppose you have not discovered this or you are not you don't accept that you actually get the string theory construction, then what are the other possibilities? Then people were actually trying to actually modify physics. Go ahead, there was a question. Okay, if you have a question, please then interrupt, otherwise not. I think not, that's okay. just some mistake. Okay, so uh, people also try to solve this problem by postulating what I'm calling new physics. That is, you change the usual assumptions about physical laws to deal with the problem. So one thing was tried by uh, Suskind and his collaborators. The, he said that maybe there are different observers see different things. He called it idea complementarity. So one observer could say, well, you do have what we just constructed. You have this central mass, and then you have all these negative energy particles, and all the data is inside the hole. But then maybe there is some other way to view the whole problem in which case all the data is outside the hole. So maybe uh, in some picture, this guy can vanish, and yet in some other picture, this guy is outside. Uh, uh, it didn't, yeah. Samir, I think uh, it is written in both inside, inside. Uh -huh. This word should be outside, thank you. Yeah. It is outside the hole. So it was not a very precise idea, and later on people also proved it wasn't correct. So the firewall paper, which some people might be familiar with, they actually made a concrete proof that this complementarity doesn't work. But uh, even before, nobody had, apart from Suskind and his students, might have taken it too seriously. It was an interesting idea, but uh, there were obviously some difficulties with that. And then uh, the firewall paper was aimed at actually proving that uh, such a thing actually doesn't happen. Okay, then you could try to say that there are very non-local effects in your gravity theory. So people like Madhusudan and Suskind in 2013 they postulated that uh, physics is not very local. When we say that information is here inside the hole or information is out here far outside the hole, maybe that is not the way to think about information in quantum gravity 
maybe anytime there's a particle somewhere and the particle somewhere they might be connected by a wormhole and they could go from inside the hole to far outside by some non-local teleportation process so people have speculated on things like that in my personal opinion those ideas are not correct because we have not actually found any such effects in string theory and in fact we can already resolve the puzzles by this uh, fuzzball paradigm so i don't think the non-local effects are really valid but that is another interesting uh, direction to pursue then other things were tried which even modified the fundamental principles of uh, quantum physics there was a paper of horowitz and malvasina several years ago where they tried to change the following basic idea of quantum theory normally our idea in physics has always been in particular in quantum mechanics that if you give data initial data on a complete surface what's called a cauchy surface then from that you can always predict the future but these people try to argue that no there could be a condition on the final state to which you evolve so if you put some condition not just initial condition but you also are allowed to give a final condition then that can force you to project onto a state where the information moves from inside automatically to outside so at this point you're really changing the fundamental principles also of quantum mechanics then you are losing quantum mechanical unitarity and so on so okay people have obviously tried lots of different things but because the problem is so complicated uh, you can see that uh, you know people are willing to try anything so we are going to actually try to see what the different puzzles are in more detail but before we go to that let's just get some estimate for the scales that we are working with so this is our picture which we drew before there's the mass capital m the test mass little m the distance r between them and this was the formula if you make this energy equal to zero and it used to happen at this radius and if you would probably generally you get the factor of two so this is the radius inside which all the difficulties start you can put the negative energy particles if you take this m to be equal to the mass of one sun once what's called a solar mass object if then that collapses to a central dot we call it a solar mass black hole then the radius r which comes out of this formula is about three kilometers so often we talk of the scale of kilometers when we talk about this radius that we are talking about inside which all these funny things will happen so if i make this a uh, radius r is obviously linear in m so uh, if you put m to be one solar mass this comes out to be three kilometers you can also have much bigger black holes if you look at a black hole like the ones at the center of many galaxies they are about 10 to the 8 solar masses and then because this is linear the length scale there will become 10 to the 8 kilometers and so in principle there's no limit to how big m you can take so really the funny thing is this looks like a very classical problem you're talking of very very big distances at the same time you're also talking about quantum mechanics and together with them you're actually coming up with a puzzle but the important thing is because these distances are very big certainly very big compared to planck length which is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters it doesn't look like quantum gravity should have anything to say about this problem if quantum gravity doesn't come in then we pretty much are supposed to know everything we know how to do quantum mechanics quantum field theory on gently curved spaces and these this uh, is a very gently curved space if you have a black hole of radius 10 to the power 8 kilometers the curvature of this in the vicinity of the region we are looking where all this funny thing is happening in the horizon region for a black hole is of the same order as the curvature that we have here on the earth we hardly notice much any quantum gravity effects here so you would think there are no quantum gravity effects there either so then the puzzle looks very robust and that was the problem but what we are going to see is that regardless string theory even though it changes physics uh, you might think only at the planck scale actually does come and change the physics over this entire region because when we drew the picture of the fuzz ball you are going to change the entire interior of this region so over very macroscopic distances uh, quantum gravity is going to come and change our physics and so one of the lessons we are looking out for is how did that happen when the natural length scale for quantum gravity was 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters how does it extend over such a big region and you could keep your you know you know your eyes open to see where those changes come along okay so now let's make a second pass at this whole thing and see what exactly hawking taught us this was our first hand weaving idea even though all the core ideas are already here now we want to learn them a little more precisely okay so how should we actually make this object i had called it a remnant i have not yet told you why it's called a remnant but how do we go around making one so we had said we take a particle and we just put it in here and then because of this negative sign its net energy will be negative and then i will put more and more such guys here okay how do i put it here so as you are uh, we have already mentioned if you only take let's say a star and you let it collapse under its own gravity we know all the mass goes to the center 
So when I draw this central dot, you should think of this as all the mass that has gone inside a black hole. And now all this other region is just the vacuum. And this dot uh, is what we call the horizon of a black hole. There is nothing there. It's just a boundary, which actually tells us what happens in the general relativity, as we will see in a minute. Once you get inside the horizon, you can't come out. So it's not like there's anything physically sitting there. If you fall in, it's not like you will hit anything there, at least in classical general relativity, but it's the boundary from which you can't escape. So we call it the horizon. The horizon is something you can't see beyond that in normal English. So if you can't, uh, you know, uh, get inside, if you're inside, you can't see outside. If you're outside, you can't see from inside there. That's why we call it the horizon. Okay, so how do you put a particle there? Well, the, do you actually put, take your hand and reach inside a black hole and put something there? Or what are you going to do? Well, the simplest thing would be just take the particle at infinity and let it fall into the black hole. By its own gravity, it will be attracted and it will reach in there. But that doesn't actually work out because as the particle falls in, it also gains kinetic energy. So it will have rest mass energy, mc squared. The potential energy, of course, will come. As it gets closer, it becomes more negative. But the kinetic energy becomes more positive. And the total energy is always conserved along an infinite trajectory. And so the total energy value will, will be what? When you started at infinity, you only had the mc squared. The potential there was zero. Maybe you started at rest, so the kinetic there was zero. So then along the entire trajectory, total energy will be mc squared, which is positive. So we did not succeed in getting what we wanted, because not only do we want to put the particle there to get this part and this part, that was okay, but we wanted to reach there with, let's say, no velocity. We don't want it to have kinetic energy so that we can get the net to be negative. So this one didn't work out. Well. Why don't we then lower it slowly with a rope? We tie it to a heavy wall over here, put a rope and put the particle if we slowly lower the particle. We are get it. Okay, so you might think that's not going to work, but it doesn't really work because now, of course, we should do everything properly with general relativity. And it turns out, as we will see in a slide shortly down, uh, down this set of slides, once you put this particle inside the horizon, actually it's not possible to keep it at rest. It keeps falling. And somehow you can't even keep it at rest. And so you, uh, because you can't prevent it from falling, you actually find the total energy. You can bring it down to mc squared, but you can't take it any lower. Or you can, in general, bring it down to zero. But uh, okay, so I, in this case, the kinetic energy can be reduced a little bit. You can, I shouldn't have written mc squared. You can bring it down to zero, but actually you can't make it uh, negative by just holding it from outside. Okay, so this also doesn't work. So how do we actually put a particle there? in a way which actually has the net negative energy. If it is coming out, it's so difficult to put it there. So like even if I had lower with the rope, the rope breaks and the guy just starts falling in uh, once you go inside. So, uh, or the rope stretches or breaks or something like that. In we are not able to do this somehow from outside. But what Hawking found was, even though we can't actually put particles like that from outside using classical physics, we automatically create particles with net negative energy inside the horizon region once we use quantum mechanics. So that's what we have to see because if you just found that with classical mechanics, at least you don't know how to put the particles there, you might start thinking maybe we should not worry about the problem. But Hawking is going to tell us, no, not only do we have to worry about it, actually it automatically forces itself upon you because you automatically end up creating these complicated objects, you can't help creating them. So let us see how that happens. So in quantum mechanics, the vacuum always has fluctuations going on at all times. So for example, in this room, even though you may take some region which looks like the vacuum, there are always vacuum fluctuations going on and they have the following kind of structure. An electron and a positron, I have drawn them by the yellow and the purple dots. They may just come out of the vacuum, stay there for a while and then annihilate back again like this. So these vacuum fluctuations, they cost energy because if this one has some mass m, then at least it has energy mc square. This also has energy at least mc square. So the total some energy delta e, which is 2 mc square or more. And where does that energy come from? It's just a fluctuation. And quantum mechanics tells us that the fluctuation can last for a short time. As long as delta e times delta t is less than or of order h bar, these fluctuations can exist and they do exist. Okay, so the room around here is always buzzing with these particle antiparticle pairs, but they last only for a short time and then they go back into the vacuum. And their effects can actually be measured in things like the lamp shift effect. So we know that these fluctuations exist. Theory predicts them and experiment also sees them. But now let us see what happens when this kind of fluctuation happens near the vacuum, near the horizon of a black hole. So now again, I have done the same kind of fluctuation. One particle is uh, inside and one particle is outside. The particle which is inside 
can be in a configuration which has net energy negative and the particle outside will outside the net energy must be positive but we can take a configuration now where the net total energy of these two particles is zero okay if i take that and put it in this equation then i find that delta t the time after which this pair should reannihilate now is actually infinity which means they don't have to reannihilate so that means what we are doing is if i create a negative energy particle inside and a positive energy particle outside this kind of pair creation which happens near the horizon of this black hole automatically because the vacuum is always fluctuating but because i have not had to pay any cost in the energy it's free the i don't have to actually go back to the case where they are annihilated this pair can just be created and stay there okay so now that i have this pair what is going to happen the member of the pair which is outside that can just drift off to infinity and just leave so black hole will automatically emit particles like this and this is what hawking discovered in 1974 and this is what we call hawking radiation where energy must be conserved so if hawking radiation came out at infinity then the mass of the hole should have gone down and it has because the particle which went in had net negative energy and we already said in a configuration like this the net mass goes down if the net mass goes down remember the radius of the horizon was 2 gm by c square so the radius also goes down so you can see the next picture i have drawn that a little smaller but then again the pair production can happen this time by chance maybe the positron is inside and the electron is outside so i drew the purple dot inside and then another particle came out so there is more radiation and this keeps happening and all the energy collects out in the radiation over here the black hole is shrinking this is what we call black hole evaporation and in the end we would have something with a very small mass or maybe massless towards the end what happens we can't say because when the thing becomes small quantum gravity effects can kick in and you can see now we have already made the object which is kind of a remnant this is what why we call it a remnant a remnant is what remains the black hole evaporates if it doesn't evaporate away completely whatever small thing is left is what we call a remnant but what is inside the remnant all the mass which initially was in the star which went into the black hole that is still in there the total mass went down only because negative energy particles appeared here and they are also in there so all this stuff is in there just like we had started in our first pass at the problem and now we have automatically managed to create remnants in fact we can't help creating these remnants because as the black hole evaporates we will automatically uh, reach here okay so now we have uh, this situation as such at this point you could still say there is no serious problem because okay we make a black hole it slowly evaporates it leaves you with remnants and you might say okay we have the remnants and then we'll have to deal with them but actually hawking found just the next year in 1974 he discovered hawking radiation but just the next year 1975 he discovered there was a serious problem with this so let us see what the problem is and the crucial issue has to do with entanglement so when we have a vacuum fluctuation let's say even in this room then you could produce an electron on the left and a positron on the right or maybe the positron on the left and electron on the right they are equally likely and so the actual wave function that you get is a linear superposition of them so you will get a state like this okay so this is what we call an entangled state so what does an entangled state mean it means if i ask you what is the state on the left does it have an electron or a positron that question doesn't have a definite answer the state on the left is an electron if the other guy is a positron and the state on the left is a positron if the other guy is an electron so this is what we call a conditional state or an entangled state uh, uh samir here yes. superposition means you want to mean plus or minus both symmetric anti symmetric both yes so i will be more precise about that in a minute so here i just wrote plus because i wanted a definite state and if you ah, just okay. to create particles from the vacuum you get a definite state so let it be this state okay okay so in fact if you actually get pair production in the vacuum you will actually get the plus but sure. the uh yeah right but if you are actually looking at more general entangled states let's just talk about them uh, in general mm. this is something very familiar to us in quantum mechanics so for example if you have two electrons uh, you know they can be you know very far apart but one can be spin up one can be spin down and then this can be spin down this can be spin up so you can make a singlet state Sure. and a singlet state for example again if you look at any one electron and you say is it spin up or spin down that question doesn't have a definite answer this electron is up if the other guy is down this is down if the other guy is up so there in that case to make a singlet i would put a minus sign but that is entangled the same way and yes. you can now see that vacuum fluctuations are entangled for multiple reasons it could be electron positron left and right or yes. since these particles carry spin it could also be that the spin is entangled and so overall when you ask for the sign i have to take all these things into account sure 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 
So you're absolutely right. I just drew the entanglement between the particle species, electron versus positron, but the same issue arises with spin. I could also have pair production of photons. They don't have charges, but if one photon is uh, you know, plus polarization, the other will be minus polarization, and then the other combination. Sure. So the, almost anything you produce out of vacuum fluctuation will always have entanglement because the vacuum itself has no spin. So if it produces a pair of particles, one should be spin up, the other should be spin down, or down and up, and it will be a superposition. Okay, so that was a very useful question. But let us see what happens with that when we are doing this near a black hole. And so the same thing will happen. If I look at this process can happen when the electron is inside, or this process can happen when the positron is inside, and they both have equal amplitude. So I will create something like this. And so you can see the state of the radiation, the particle that goes outside, is entangled with the state of what is left behind. Because the state outside, if you ask if it is a definite particle, electron or positron, or let's just talk about spin. If I ask what is the spin of the particle which came out, is it spin up or is it spin down? The question does not have a definite answer. It is spin up if the other guy is down, it is spin down if the other guy is up, and the actual state is the superposition of these two with equal weights. Sign could be minus, but the probability is 50. Okay, but this is the very crucial statement. The state of the radiation is entangled with the state of the remnant. But you can see the amount of this entanglement will become very large because we are going to emit many, many particles of radiation from the black hole uh, before the black hole is completely gone. And if each particle can have two states, then there are two to the n possible arrangements. Let's say an electron we denote as a zero and a positron we denote as a one. Then the emission can be such that, suppose all the things which came out were electrons, then all the guys get left behind were positrons. This is one configuration which is possible. Or maybe they came out in some sequence. The first guy was a uh, positron, the, the, uh, the coming out guys. So positron, electron, positron, electron, electron. So the, instead of being just two things, up, down, and down, up, two possibilities superposed, you actually have, you can see two to the power n possibilities here, and the corresponding two to the n possibilities here, each of these combinations are possible and they are, you're getting a linear superposition of all of them. We call this state as being highly entangled because if we had two systems, this is in state one and this is state one prime, plus this is state two, state two prime, plus state three, state three prime. Yet to, the number of terms in that thing tells you how much entanglement you have. So for the case of two electrons, there were just two terms in the state, up, down, minus, down, up. But now if you have many terms, we say it is more entangled. So you can see the entanglement will be very large between the radiation and the black hole and the remnant by the time the whole thing has evaporated because the starting black hole was so big, it was going to emit a very large number of particles. Okay, so now what, there are two possibilities. We are just making our second pass at the problem. So you will see the same possibilities as the ones that we had before. One, the information loss, which Hawking had suggested way back in 1975 himself. The evaporation can keep going on till the remnant has zero mass. And so there's no mass there. And this thing just goes to the vacuum. That's the simplest thing you might imagine if something evaporates. And now you only have this thing left, and, but this thing doesn't have a definite state, the radiation. It has a little bit of each of these things. And now you have a funny problem. You might say that is okay, all my energy has come out in the radiation. That looks fine to me. And this one has many, many different states over here. Why can't that also be okay? But actually we'll see in a minute it is not okay because there is no state that you can assign to this object. So why is there no state that you can assign to this? So suppose you think of the electron case again, a singlet, two electrons far away, maybe one in that room, one in this room, and this is spin up times down, and then you have to add to that spin down times up. Up to here, everything is okay. The two electrons can be very far. I can put one on the Earth, one on Mars. They don't have to be close. I just have a superposition, so that is still okay. But suppose the, the electron which is on Mars now disappears from my universe and doesn't exist anymore. Then can I define a state for the other guy? So the answer is no because this guy didn't have a state by itself. It was spin up if the other guy was down, it was spin down if the other guy was up. But the other guy doesn't exist anymore, so what do I say about this guy? Is it up or is it down? And Hawking found that this guy could not be assigned any state. And if you have some mass to which you cannot assign any state, now that's a violation of quantum mechanics. You can still assign probabilities, 50% chance of being up, 50% chance of being down. These kinds of things in statistical physics are called density matrices. Usually they are approximations. Every system has a true properly defined state, but if you only want the probabilities and not care about the actual state, you can define it by a density matrix. But what Hawking is, was saying was, when a black hole forms and evaporates, at the end what you're left with, it just cannot have any fundamental state. It's not a question of an approximation. 
It just doesn't have a state at all because you can only give the probabilities for it to be different things, not actual wave functions. Now, this may still not look very uh, clear to you because you might think if we have two electrons spin up, down, minus, down, up, and one electron is gone from the universe, why can't they say that the remaining electron has a definite state spin up plus down? Suppose you said that. At least that looks like a state. Spin up plus spin down, normalized with one by root two, looks like a state. But let me just show you, since uh, all of you definitely know quantum mechanics, let me show you why you can't assign it a state. That's really important to understand, to understand the information puzzle. So here again, I have drawn the two particles, the ones I was just talking about. First particle on the left, second particle on the right. So my state is spin up times down, minus down times up. That is what makes a singlet. Now suppose I take this and the first particle here, it disappears from the universe. That's why I've drawn a circle over it. Suppose it's gone from the universe. What would you say is the state of the second particle? You might try to say it is spin down minus up. Okay, spin up minus spin down or spin down minus spin up. Okay, they just differ by a phase, but they're the same state. If you go back to your knowledge of spins, you will find this is a spin polarized around along the minus x direction. So you have the poly matrix sigma one, this is the eigenstate of that with eigenvalue minus one. It's a spin polarized along minus x. You might say, okay, at least what I had left seems to be having a state. And if this was true, you would not worry so much. You would say, I have a state for what is left behind. But there is a problem. I could have written the same state which I had up here in the first box in this alternative way. So what is the alternative way? To the first particle, I say it is up times down. And here it is e to the sum i theta for some theta times down, and I multiply this one by a to the minus i theta. Now, if I have two particles in a system, the wave function is a product. If I multiply one of them by a to the i theta by a to the minus i theta, I actually have the same state. So I've written the state also in this way. You cannot choose which one is better than the other. And now suppose somebody said the first particle is gone from the universe. Okay, I take it away again. What am I left for the second particle? I left to spin up minus some phase times, spin down minus some phase times spin up. Now what do I have? Let's use different values of theta. If you take theta equals pi, then this becomes minus one and the whole thing becomes up plus down. Up plus down is what state of a spin? Again, if you go back to the polymetric sigma one, up plus down is also an eigenstate of sigma one with, with an eigenvalue plus one. Now you would say the spin is polarized along plus x. Actually, by choosing different values of theta, if I chose theta equal to pi by two, I could make it an eigenvalue of sigma y. Spin could be along y direction. You can see from this that if one uh, member of a pair, entangled pair, disappears from the universe, there is no way to actually assign a state to what gets left behind. So this is the reason that you actually have information loss. And this is why Hawking said that after a black hole evaporates, what is left cannot be assigned any quantum state and it can only be defined in probabilities. In all these cases, you can say the probability of spin up, which is this amplitude mod square, is 50%, and probability of spin down mod square is also 50%. But that's incomplete information. You don't actually have a wave function for this. one. So you can see how serious this problem is. Let me just pause here to see if this was clear, because this is a very important point in understanding the information paradox. Okay. So if this possibility is not good, suppose people are not happy with that, what are our other choices? Let us assume that the evaporation stops when we get to a Planck sized remnant. Then the remnant must have a large number of internal states. We already said that. It's all highly entangled. So all these possible states must be in there. If you are entangled with I'm state one, and then the other system is state one prime, plus state two, other system is state two prime. If I have something like that, all these states one prime, two prime, and so on must be in there. So the remnant must have so many states, but now its mass has already gone down to Planck mass. Its size has gone down to Planck size. By that same formula, we had R is two GM by C squared. If I have such a little mass and such a little volume, how do I fit so many states in there? Normally in quantum physics, if I fix the volume to be small and the energy level to be small, there are very few states in there. One cell of phase space with delta X Delta, the, the volume times the delta x cube times delta p cube, the volume of phase space, when that is order h bar, you can normally fit one quantum state in there. So normally if you actually compute how many quantum states you can fit in a Planck volume with Planck mass, you'd found, find the answer is sort of order one. But you have to fit an unbounded number of states because how many of these things there are? The larger the black hole you start with before evaporating down, the more the number of states you have in the remnant. You have to fit an unbounded number of states here. 
Okay, so you can see this other option is not very nice either. So what are we going to do? This is our puzzle. So let us just summarize the puzzle to, to then move on to looking at possible other issues. You start with a star that has a well-defined state. It collapses under its own gravity. All the mass goes to the center. All this region becomes the vacuum. This circle only denotes the horizon radius. There's nothing sitting there in classical general relativity. And we have a black hole. Then Hawking tells us that pairs will start getting created just by vacuum fluctuations around this horizon. And they are entangled. And as this evaporation proceeds, it will come down either to the vacuum. And that creates a big problem that quantum mechanics is violated. What is left doesn't have any state. Or maybe the evaporation stops at the Planck scale. But then you have a Planck size remnant, which has an unbounded number of internal states. And we want to know, is that really true? How do we deal with that? So in either case, you can summarize them together and say, there is a problem near the end point of evaporation. And that is what we call the black hole information map. Okay. So this is maybe one logical pause point in our talk. And let me see if anybody has questions on any of the material we just talked about. Uh, guys, please ask question. I, uh, to ask question, please unmute yourself and ask to the speaker. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask uh, that the problem which we are dealing with, the information paradox problems that we have, you have just mentioned about, uh, are they a property of, like, I, I think they are not just a property of squash child black holes, right? They, these problems also exist when we talk about curve black holes. Yes, of course. Anything which has a horizon has this problem because inside a horizon you can find a region where you can have negative energy modes and then the problem starts. So, but for curved black holes, we have a region between the uh, horizon and the Earth sphere between which we can also have some negative energy states, like some negative energy, uh, some a region where this negative energy of the particle, the uh, test particle can exist. So, like, uh, does, does that create some information paradox problems or we just have to always be inside the horizon to create such problem. So the problem actually comes only from the horizon. So what you're talking about is the region called the ergosphere. And in the ergosphere, there are particles which are in principle, if you actually supply enough energy to those particles, you can extract them. They are just rotating in the ergosphere, but they have so much rotation that uh, with that much energy that they have, most of the energy is actually going in the rotation. And so that's why there's not enough energy for them to come out. But if you come from outside and supply some energy and say, okay, I brought a rocket, I bring some energy, I change their angular momentum, I impart some angular momentum, I impart some energy, I pick up this particle, I want to take it outside, you can take it outside. So, but once something has gone inside the black hole, you, there's no actual trajectory from there which can actually come outside. There's no path which stays within the light cone which can come outside. So the situation actually changes with the horizon qualitatively. The ergosphere can happen even without a horizon. So if you have a very fast rotating neutron star, it can actually have an ergosphere. But there are no puzzles with that. Okay, um, that makes it clear. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Sir, uh, I have to ask a question. Uh, sir, uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Please please ask. Ask. Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, why this uh, uh, entanglement uh, breaks and not to not break down in uh, at the uh, horizon because it uh, it uh, yeah what uh, why does not break down at the horizon so you are saying that if i have one thing is inside the horizon one is outside then they are sort of separated by some horizon so the entanglement should break down is that what you are asking yes sir, they uh, experience the gravitational force right so one particle uh, one so particle uh... so actually the entanglement does not break down so easily because there is a gravitational force at the horizon and it is true that information from inside the horizon cannot come outside because the light cone structure which we will see in a minute is such that you cannot come from inside to outside but the idea of entanglement does not require any causal connection or any force. So for example, if I take two electrons and put them in an entangled state, up, down, minus, down, up, then I take one particle all the way to the other end of the universe. The problem is they are still entangled. Now, maybe I cannot send any information from here to there 
in the next one million years, but it doesn't affect the fact that they are entangled. I cannot even influence that by any force. That still does not affect the fact that they are entangled. So entanglement is simply coming from linear superposition in quantum mechanics. If I have a state up times down and a state down times up, I can add the two states. So as long as I have states in a Hilbert space, which I can just superpose, I will always get the issue of entanglement. So the horizon does not break the entanglement. The only thing I need is that the Hilbert space should include both the inside and the outside. And when we look at the structure of the black hole in general relativity, yes, the Hilbert space includes them both as two parts of space time. They are not so different from being here and on Mars. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Any, any other questions or comments for me? Um, hello, maybe I could ask you a question. Yes. Uh, so yes. maybe you already mentioned that, uh, and it's very elementary. Uh, the, qu the question is that uh, would the horizon shrink uh, no matter if the particle or antiparticle fall into it? Yes, because both particles and antiparticles have the same mass. They normally a particle and antiparticle actually do not, it's not like an antiparticle has negative energy or something. By itself, every particle, like a proton and antiproton, they both have the same mass. 980 MeV. Electron, positron, they have the same mass. They are antiparticle. The antipart only affects the charge. One is positively charged in this case, one is negatively charged in this case. But otherwise, they behave identically as far as gravity is concerned. So, 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 why would you say that the horizon should shrink? I would say that the horizon is just a, is a, is like some sort of a motor that, that ex extracts energy from the vacuum and, and shoots it away. You know? Can you repeat the last part? The horizon should not shrink because. I mean, I, I, I could interpret that the horizon is some sort of an engine that extracts energy from the vacuum and shoots it away. I mean, why should why should this the result of falling a mass into the Horizon shrink, that's my question. Okay, good. So what we had found was when the mass is inside the horizon in a specific yes. configuration where the mc square of that mass is smaller than the minus gmm over r because the r is now quite small, it's inside that radius. So the net energy is negative. If the net energy of this object is negative, the total mass in this region has gone down. If the total mass goes down, then we use the formula that the radius of the horizon is just 2 gm by c square. If the total mass has gone down, the horizon radius has to shrink because horizon is the ra radius where the gravitational attraction of that becomes net, such that it can create net, net negative energy particles. So if I put a negative energy mass in there, the mass goes down, and then I use the formula, the radius of the horizon is 2 gm by c square. That is why it shrank. Yes. Thank you. Are there more questions? Okay, very good. Yeah, or, go ahead. or you can actually proceed. Maybe the other people will ask at the end or maybe in between. Okay, okay. very good. So then you can ask, so we just got a paradox here. So you can ask, given how much trouble we are having because we have this horizon, that's how all this puzzle came. See, we can create all these pairs because we have a horizon. Is there some way that we can prevent the formation of a horizon in our problem? So instead of having things like this, Maybe we only have stars and planets, we never have a black hole. But it is actually very hard to stop black hole formation. And what is the reason? We have already seen this is the formula for the radius of the horizon. Let us again do some rough qualitative physics. If you're in flat space, which of course we are not, this is a black hole, but just to get some estimate of orders of magnitude, if you have a mass density rho, then in a radius r, this will be the mass. So let's put this mass into this uh, formula to see how big a ball of this density rho we need so that it should actually make a horizon. So then I put the r here and I put this m on this side. And if I solve this equation, you can see I have one power of r cancels and I can take the rho out on the other side. And you can see the rho goes like this one by r square. You don't actually need to see all the numbers in here. The only physics that we are learning from here is that suppose I want to make a very big black hole. Suppose r wants to be a million miles then the row which I need to do that is actually very small. It is one over R square. So you will see if I want to make a very big black hole, the density of mass matter which I need is very low. So if I need a very low density of matter, as long as I have enough of that, like going on for a long distance R, it will be enough to actually make a black hole. So if the matter density is very low, then we don't expect non-trivial physics like quantum gravity or anything new to come in. So you would think that low density matter we understand. And if we understand low density matter, 
and is making a black hole when there is enough of this matter, then how do you prevent forming a black hole? So uh, it's very difficult to imagine a theory, at least for classical gravity people, that you would not get a black hole. Okay. So let's see what general relativity actually has to say about all this. Why can't we actually imagine we have all this matter and it doesn't make a horizon? Where are the real difficulties? Here's just a cartoon version of general relativity. I'm sure you all know much more about general relativity than what I have drawn here. The idea is that mass curves spacetime. So in flat spacetime, we just have these light cones and spacetime is flat, there's no mass here. And in flat spacetimes, you know, things just move in straight lines, the particles move in a straight line. But if you have a mass somewhere, a mass m, then the mass curves spacetime. When the spacetime is curved, the light cones also bend. And because all the spacetime is curved, now our test mass will actually move in, let's say, orbits around the sun, the earth going around the sun. It's all in the curvature of spacetime. I'm just repeating the normal things you read in colloquial literature about how general relativity behaves. But what is important for this is that if we apply it to what a black hole is doing, this is what the picture looks like. So in this picture, think of time as going up. That's why the light cones far away just point up like this. This is r equal to zero in the middle. And this uh, is the uh, orange thing you can think of as the mass in the center of the black hole. And then this direction is radially outwards. So what happens is as you start coming closer to this dotted line, which is the horizon, then the light cones start tilting a little bit inwards. You can see the light cones far away are just up here. So it's equally easy to go inwards as outwards. But as you come closer to the horizon, it's a little more difficult to go out. It's easier to come in, it's sort of pushing you in a little bit. But a horizon forms when the light cone tilts so much that in fact, even if you try to go out at the maximum possible rate, you can't go out. You can see that all the time-like curves that stay on the light cone inside the light cone or even the null curve that can go up to the surface, none of them can actually go to a larger radius, you are trapped. And if you go further in, the light cone points purely in place. Even that would be going faster than the speed of light. You can see standing at one place, a fixed radius would be uh, going out at the light cone. You have to go inwards. So once something becomes smaller than, suppose you have a star whose size has become smaller than its horizon radius, every point in the star must keep going in and in till it goes all the way down to r equal to zero. So that is why the black hole inside has to be basically empty, at least in classical general relativity. Once you compress yourself to inside the horizon radius, you actually can't stop. It's not a question of not having a, which force can be strong enough to stop you. As long as things cannot move faster than the speed of light, it doesn't even matter what force you might think about, it has to keep compressing all the way till it goes to the origin. And anything here, since it gets pushed to the origin, is all region clears out and you get the vacuum. So once you make a horizon, you are bound to just make the black hole. Well, then can you prevent the formation of a horizon? Then maybe if you don't have a horizon, then the light will never tilt enough. And then maybe you will never have a problem. We have this thing called the Buchdahl theorem. He said that if the, you take a perfect fluid ball, a ball of perfect fluid, whose radius is, let's say, two and a quarter m. You remember, that? so now I'm using units where g and c and h bar are set to one. We often do that because once you get into uh, interesting calculations, you don't want to keep having the g and the m and so on. In those units, the radius of the horizon was just two m. It's two g m by c squared, you remember that? But if I call g as one and c as one, then the radius is just two m. This is two and a quarter m. So you might think that you could make a fluid ball of two and a quarter m radius, that's at least bigger than the horizon radius. Can that be stable and just stay there? Actually, what Bugdal proved was the moment the radius of the ball becomes less than two and a quarter m, it actually has to compress. And then of course, it compress beyond the size two m. Once it goes beyond the size two m, which is the horizon radius, then the argument of light cones takes over and then nothing can stop you anyway. So how did he prove that? He argued that if you try to make a ball of radius two and a quarter m or less, then you have to solve the pressure balance equation. The pressure at the surface has to be zero because the mass has finished there. And then any matter out here, there has to be more pressure inside than outside because the net pressure outwards has to balance the attraction of gravity. It's the standard way we solve for the increase in pressure as you go deeper into a star. But suppose you solve the pressure balance equation and you see the pressure starting from zero at the boundary is increasing, increasing as you go in. Suppose it reaches infinity at some point. Well, you can't have infinite pressure. So then you would say this star cannot exist and the whole thing must collapse. For people who are really interested in the general relativity of this, otherwise you cannot focus on this slide. I just put it down here for technical purposes. You write down the metric of a star and then you take the stress tensor for something having density and pressure. And then you solve the gradient equation for pressure. P 
prime means dp by dr, just what I was saying in words before, at the boundary you put p equal to zero. Then you see how much is dp by dr, how much does pressure have to increase to the inside. If the pressure will diverge somewhere at what Mugdal proved, or the pressure will diverge at some point before reaching the origin, if the starting radius was less than two and a quarter. This slide looks technical. It is not meant for anybody who doesn't want to see it. We will not be using anything technical. But then, since he had proved this, uh, he did, one then just finds that if you start with a ball which is less than this radius, it will cross through R equals 2M and go ahead and make the black hole. So now it seems you can't even stop making a black hole. You stop making a horizon and then the black hole. Once you compress something to 2 and a quarter M, it will keep compressing, go through 2M, go all the way to 0, and then the light cone structure takes over. You have to get a black hole. Once you definitely have to get the black hole, you're going to make these entangled pairs. Make the entangled pairs, you have the information paradox. Okay, so can we then keep the horizon, but maybe modify the structure around the horizon? Because uh, Hawking assumed the vacuum in this region. Maybe if the structure is something slightly different, then uh, maybe what could happen is that we don't create the entangled pairs, we create something else. But even that is not easy. If you try to put anything near the horizon to change the behavior near the horizon, Whatever you put there, it just gets sucked in. Because if you try to stand near the horizon of a black hole, you know the closer you go to the horizon, if you put a rocket here, you need more and more rocket power to stand there. And you know, if you go inside the horizon, you can't stand there. We already proved that. So just as you get close to the horizon, it becomes harder and harder to stand there. At the horizon, it's infinitely difficult to stand there. So if you, for example, say, I have string theory. I will put a string near the horizon. That can modify the behavior of creation of entangled pairs. It doesn't help. The string is just going to fall in and you go back to this black hole. So black holes have nothing on the horizon. Everything gets sucked in. Black holes seem to have no features, no structure. And this person, John Wheeler, put that fact in this phrase, black holes have no hair. They are just identically bald. They have just have all the mass in the center, vacuum everywhere else. And then, of course, Hawking's argument proceeds. Okay, so we're just seeing the difficulties of getting out of Hawking's puzzle. So really, the information paradox is the combination of two problems. One. The no hair theorems tell us that the black hole will always have this form with the vacuum around here. So we can't get out of this structure of the black hole. And with this structure of the black hole, we will get the creation of entangled pairs. Now I've just written them as one pair of particles, one inside, one outside. And then, uh, you know, you have the Hawking puzzle. But what we are actually going to see later in string theory is that the first of these will turn out to be wrong. Uh, you will not actually have the no hair theorem. You will not actually make a black hole. You will make a first ball. Then there's no, nothing like this. There's no region inside the horizon and you will not create pairs. That's what we will get as a solution. But as I said, you should really watch out for the fact, how did that happen? Because the black hole is so big, many kilometers big. And normally you would think string theory only takes over at the Planck scale. So how did we get macroscopic effects? We will come back and answer that question. But right now, let's continue. So the other aspect of this puzzle that we need to understand is something called the idea of the entropy of a black hole. So this is a second puzzle that people had with black holes, and let us talk about this. So uh, the idea of black hole entropy. I, mean, I just want to interrupt one uh, yes. time more. Uh, I know that, uh, like, uh, the issue of this unitarity is very important, which has to be addressed, and that's why all this effort is uh, made to, uh, like, maintain the unitarity and all, yes. but. So there are like proposals in quantum mechanics these days, uh, you probably heard about something called open quantum systems, where uh, things are not unitary. Once you are looking into the uh, subsystem dynamics, maybe the, as a whole, the total system is unitary, but if you want to uh, like trace over the like uh, out, outside region or something, we call it bath or thermal bath, and then uh, we found that the uh, internal dynamics of that system is non-unitary. So uh, like, is this kind of possibility exist here as well? Can one think of? Okay, so let, let me clarify that the puzzle only comes when you think of the entire system. You have to think of the inside of the black hole uh -huh. and the radiation which you have collected outside. Uh -huh. So the puzzle is phrased in terms of the complete system. It is true that if you ever take only a part of a system, mm -hmm. then you know that does not have to be unitary by itself because, well, yeah. because it's interacting. You can't define a unitary operation. If something are leaving the system, then degrees of freedom are going out. 
So hmm. then of course you make instant make you make a lot of approximations because you know you may be wanting to focus on a given subsystem. But hmm. Hawking's puzzle is a very fundamental puzzle. He's saying we will look at everything. Ah, once okay. you look at everything, the black hole and the radiation, everything. Then if you have a problem with unitarity, then quantum mechanics has broken down. And okay. that is the actual problem. So this is the for the total system, it is non-unitary. That is the problem because we start with a completely good system, a star and nothing else in the world that has a well-defined state. It makes a black hole, you get the pairs. Then the, in the end, the black hole is gone. Maybe the, only the pairs are left. The outside radiation is left. But now the radiation doesn't have any state. It can only be described by a density matrix, suppose. And you say, that's not okay. Because I'm looking at everything. Hmm. I don't care how complicated it is. It's a question of principle. The final thing should have a definite state, psi final, which is given by e to the minus i h t with some h on psi hmm. initial. And I'm not finding that. True. True. So okay. that is Thank you for the clarification. Okay, very good. So let's go on to this other side of the puzzle, which started with the work of Bekenstein, uh, even before the work of Hawking, two years before in 1972. And what did Bekenstein say? He said, suppose you have a black hole. Let me take a box containing some gas. And the gas has some entropy, which I will call S. Let me throw the gas into the black hole. It goes inside, it disappears. Then the entropy has gone from the universe. So have I not violated the second law of thermodynamics? I had some entropy S of this gas. Now I have gotten rid of it. Entropy should never decrease, but I have decreased it. And then of course, this is silly. Uh, it, it hasn't decreased. The gas has gone into the black hole. Like suppose I threw the black hole into the garbage can here. Then I don't see the, suppose I throw the gas into the garbage can. It's true that I don't see the gas but the entropy of the garbage can have gone up. So if I go and look in there, I will find the entropy there. So in the black hole, the entropy must be there, except the problem is in the black hole, you can't see anything. Because the gas all goes to the center and disappears into the reality, you can't see it, but somehow it should be there, you would think. But then if you actually try to do this uh, by a little bit of uh, Gedanken experiments, if I throw this much entropy, where does it go? If you throw some entropy into the black hole, the mass of the black hole goes up. So then the radius goes up because the radius was 2 gm by c squared. So the black hole becomes bigger. So even though we can't see inside the black hole, what uh, Bekenstein found was, suppose we assume that the black hole has an entropy, which is proportional to the surface area of the black hole. So here I have c and h bar and g, but if you put c and h bar to one, it looks just like a by four g. That's a very uh, standard formula to remember. So if you uh, assign this much entropy to the black hole, then the second law works out perfectly. Whatever entropy you lose because the gas has gone into the hole, that much entropy is actually uh, then recovered because the, the black hole becomes bigger, the area of the black hole becomes bigger, so the entropy of the black hole becomes bigger. So the total entropy, the d by dt of the matter, which now decreased, and the d by dt of the hole, which now increased, the total will be actually increasing or staying the same. That's what we want from the second law of thermodynamics. So without knowing what is going on in the black hole, so just assuming that the law of thermodynamics is true, we can actually guess what is the entropy of the black hole. And this is the formula that Bekenstein found. Bekenstein could not find the proportionality constant, but then with the work of Hawking that also came out. So this is a beautiful formula because with this, we can do something very interesting. If somebody gave you a formula for the entropy of a system and the area I can put in immediately because the horizon radius was two gm by c squared. I'm using units where c is equal to one. So the radius r is two gm. So four pi r square is the surface area, and here's the four g. So you get some answer for the entropy. And then you know in thermodynamics, you have the basic formula, T ds is dE, okay? So I can find the T from ds by dm and taking the inverse. If I have S given like this in terms of M, you can do ds by dm, you get eight pi gm, you take the reciprocal, you find this. Okay, so this is very interesting. By just playing with the idea of entropy and using the ideas of thermodynamics, we have been able to predict a temperature for the black hole. It will look interesting, but for a person doing classical mechanics, this should be a problem. Why is this a problem? Because in normal stat mech, you can prove that you have something called the principle of detailed balance. And what detailed balance means is, suppose you have like a piece of coal, and if it has a non-zero temperature, and now we have found the black hole has a non-zero temperature, then if the coal can absorb something, it also has to emit. The two are actually connected. The rate of absorption, suppose the absorption cross section is sigma, then the rate of emission has to be given by sigma times the phase space factor, which involves the temperature. Okay. But 
it's not possible for a black for any body to be able to absorb and not emit as long as the temperature is not this. This is called the principle of detailed balance. The phase space factor is like d3p over 2 pi cube upon 1 over e to the e over kt minus 1. So it depends on the temperature, but there is a definite formula for that. In classical mechanics, the black hole can absorb because things can fall into the black hole. But in classical mechanics, because the light goes point inwards, nothing can come out of the black hole. So if the black hole had a temperature, we have a serious problem. There's a conflict with statistical mechanics. So classically, black holes absorb, but nothing can come out of the black hole. But quantum mechanically, we have already seen that black holes emit Hawking radiation. And if I assume that that Hawking radiation, uh, if I just see what it's doing, then I find it actually has a temperature, which is 1 over 8 pi gm. So Hawking's calculation, actually, because he did the calculation of the radiation, he found a temperature. And that's how we sort of went backwards and fixed this factor of 1 by 4 in Bekenstein's relation. Bekenstein did not know the factor. But since you can compute Hawking radiation with the work of Hawking, then you know the temperature, you put it back here, and then you find the entropy is A by 4. But all this is nicely fitting together and making us a beautiful thermodynamics. Black holes have an entropy, they have a temperature, they radiate at the temperature, and all this looks very beautiful. So you can see this thermodynamics in very simple ways. In hand-waving ways, we can understand all about the radiation. The wavelength of the particles you emit from the black hole, we talked about emitting electrons and positrons before, but that was only for ease of talking. Because the temperature is usually very low for a black hole, the particles emitted are usually the very light particles, like photons, graviton. So they are mainly characterized by their wavelength, and there's only one length scale in the black hole, which is the horizon radius. For a solar mass black hole, that's three kilometers. Right? So the wavelength of the particles coming out will be ordered three kilometers. You can see that's very, very low energy photon. After one photon comes out of wavelength three kilometers, when does the next one come out? There's only one less scale in the problem. Once this one moves by three kilometers, the next one starts, roughly speaking. Okay, so the interval between different photons is the R divided by C. They travel at the speed of light, so distance apart. Then what's the total time for the black hole to evaporate? Well, you know the total mass of the black hole, mc squared. You know how much energy each of these quanta have. Okay. It is h nu. Nu is, h, nu, nu is c by lambda. So then you can just put that in, and the time of evaporation you find goes like this. A heavy black hole evaporates in a very long time. And if you actually put in the number for a solar mass black hole here, you find it will evaporate in 10 to the power 63 years. That is much more than the age of the universe, which is less than 10 to the power 11 years. So this is a conceptual problem. Uh, you know, if only if a black hole had mass less than 10 to the power 16 grams, a solar mass is 10 to the power 33 grams. But only if you had a mass less than 10 to the 16 grams, it would evaporate in the age of the universe. But this is a very simple way to get all the length scales for Hawking radiation. And uh, I just wanted to put this up. Now, let's see what's the puzzle with entropy. So we already said the black hole has this amount of entropy. And what does statistical mechanics tell us? Statistical mechanics tells us that the entropy is a count of the number of states. If a system has n states, then log n is what we call the entropy of the system. So if this is the entropy of the black hole, then the black hole should have e to the power of that many states. If you put in that the solar mass black hole in there, you find a solar mass black hole should have 10 to the power 10 to the power 77 states. It's a very large entropy. It is much larger than the entropy you would get for ordinary gas with that much mass. So the sun doesn't have this much entropy, but if the sun made a black hole and then you use Bekenstein's formula, you get this very large entropy. Well, where are all these states? You should see this many different orthogonal states in the system just by the logic of StatMec. But we have already seen that black holes have no structure. That was a statement of Wheeler, black holes have no hair. There are no distortions of the black hole. The distortions just fall in and make the black hole completely have a standard geometry, which is fixed by just its mass, charge, and angular momentum, three parameters. If it has a unique state, then the entropy would be log of one, and that would be zero. Now that is in conflict with the fact that we had uh, expected such a big entropy. So again, we can ask the question, where are the states of the black hole? So even with the entropy of the black hole, we are having a puzzle. In fact, there's a deeper puzzle, which is called the bags of gold problem, also connected to entropy. So let us look at that puzzle as well. So the question we ask is, this answer we got from Bekenstein's argument, it looked to be very good, but is it really giving us a count of the number of states in the black hole? Statmec, if Statmec were true, and the Bekenstein uh, computation was true, you should find this many states. Well. Bekenstein was also conjecturing that the black hole somehow has maximal entropy. That if you have that much mass m, 
for a black hole and the region I give you is the same horizon radius 2GM, you cannot actually fit more entropy in there than a black hole would have. You might have heard this phrase before, black holes are somehow the most entropic objects possible with that much energy in that much volume. It has been a popular conjecture. Unfortunately, if the semi-classical picture of the black hole, which we have been using, that all the mass is in the center, everything else is the vacuum, if that picture is correct at all, you can actually have an arbitrarily large number of states in that same region. But we have already seen that. Didn't we already see that if I make this kind of a structure, I can start with the big mass, I can dial it down by putting these things, the kind of remnant, but I have an infinite number of remnants. So in fact, I can make an infinite amount of entropy in the black hole with that much mass and that much radius. And so I have all three problems. Bekestan gave me a finite but large answer. If I look at the black hole, I have no hair kind of idea. It suggests the entropy is actually zero. If I look at the remnant kind of construction, the entropy is actually infinity. Nothing is making sense. Let's just see this fact now in terms of general relativity. Now that we have talked a bit about general relativity, we can do better than our schematic picture. This is the metric people write down for the Schwarzschild black hole. And again, if you're not familiar with general relativity, you can ignore these few slides. They will not affect your understanding of what we talk about later. The crucial point about this metric that people write down for the black hole is that it is actually good only for r bigger than 2m. Because at r equals 2m, now I have put g equal to 1, c equal to 1. Okay? Because otherwise, there are too many you know, uh, symbols to carry around on the slide or a piece of paper. So uh, with this structure, you can see when r becomes equal to 2m, all these coefficients in the metric, they become singular. If r is less than 2m, you can still use this metric, but you have to sort of redefine a new coordinate patch. What do we learn from these two coordinate patches? For r bigger than 2m, this part of the metric, the t square has a negative coefficient, so t is time. And if you want to make a space-like slice, what makes a Cauchy surface on which we give data, t equal to constant is a typical Cauchy surface. And that makes sense because the time rate. But if r is less than 2m, that means if you're inside the horizon, you can see that this number is negative. So dt square has a positive coefficient. So what you used to call t is actually a space coordinate. But the coefficient of dr square is negative. So r, the radial direction, is actually time. This should not be so surprising. It really corresponds to the fact that the light cone is sort of turned over. So anyway, what does this mean? This means if I have to make a space-like surface on which I want to give initial data, outside the black hole, the space-like surface would look like t equal to constant. But inside the black hole, a space-like surface would look like r equal to constant. For example, let's take r equals m. m is halfway between the center r equal to 0 and the horizon which is 2m. So let me take something right in between, a surface r equal to m. But r equal to m is a given radius. How long can I make that surface? The length along that surface is given by the other parameter t. t can be as long as I want, and you get the following interesting picture. This is time direction upwards. This is the picture in which we had drawn the light cones before. This is the horizon radius r equals 2m. And you can see I have drawn a surface which is at a constant r, uh, t before, t equal to constant outside. But inside the horizon, I have taken r equal to constant. In fact, I took r equal to m as an arbitrary choice. So I can make a surface like this which I can make to be very long, as long as I want. I have drawn this thing here to say a shell of mass collapses to make a black hole, and then this is the singularity at r equal to zero. This is how you dynamically collapse and make a black hole. If you haven't seen this picture before, it's okay. But this is the general, this is the general relativity picture of a Schwarzschild black hole made by the collapse of a shell. The only part of this picture which is important to us is that this part r equal to constant can be as long as you want, so you can keep putting lots of quanta here. You can put photons here, which have positive energy or negative energy. The same kind of pictures we already saw in terms of working with a heuristic picture at the start of this talk can actually all be seen in full general relativity. The energy of a quantum on the surface when seen from infinity is given by taking the four momentum of this quantum, k, and taking a dot product with the killing vector in this geometry. And that number can be negative, which is for this red quanta. Number can be positive for the blue quanta, and so you can keep canceling their energies. Put no net energy, I don't want to add any extra energy, but since each of these photons can have a spin, I can have, let's say, one bit per, uh, per, per photon, and so I have two to the n states with an arbitrary n, and here, now in general relativity, for people who do know general relativity, all the pictures we had 
shown before in schematic ways like this. We had been saying inside the black hole, I can store an arbitrary amount of information because each of these quanta which I put uh, can have two states. Now that is all explicitly there for people who know general relativity, this is now rigorous. Okay. So the conclusion is all that you need to take from here. We don't actually want to do, deal with this in detail. You can store an arbitrary amount of entropy much bigger than the Bekerstein value, arbitrarily bigger inside the horizon while keeping the total mass at M because both negative and positive energies are allowed inside. I don't actually have to increase the energy and I can still store an arbitrary amount of entropy. Okay, so this is just to put a slightly technical spin for people who know general relativity. And as we have said before, these kinds of states are automatically created by Hawking radiation. Again, the same thing we saw schematically before, but now for people who know general relativity and can see the structure of space-time metrics, a Hawking particle is created, it goes out, a particle to that can be left inside, matter can fall in, the pairs are entangled, all that picture about where the particles are going in, we do them as dots before, but they are actually drawn as quanta on these surfaces, and you can make everything rigorous in terms of general relativity. We don't want to use any of this, so let's go back to our schematic uh, way of talking about the puzzle. So in the end, the question is, should we say that S Bekenstein, A by 4G, is not a count of the states in the whole? We have seen all the different problems. If you think black holes have no hair, it has one state that gives an entropy zero. From dynamical argument of Bekenstein gives a definite answer, A by 4G, it's non-zero, very large. Structure of the black hole allows you to have infinitely many states inside the hole. You can get an unbounded entropy. What's the correct answer? So we have the Hawking puzzle on the one hand. We have the entropy puzzle on the other hand. Black holes are having lots of different problems. But in one sense, they're all being created because we have a horizon. Once you have a horizon, light goes turn inwards. You can store negative energy particles. You can see all the difficulties really coming because of this idea that you can have negative energy particles inside a horizon. The Hawking puzzle came because of that. The entropy puzzle came because of that. You can see they are connected. What we're going to see later is that these two puzzles, which look like different puzzles, will actually come and solve each other. If we did not have the entropy puzzle, such a large because of entropy, we couldn't actually have gone and solved the Hawking puzzle and vice versa. So you will see that when we come to seeing how the puzzle is solved with the fuzz ball construction in string theory. So let me talk a little bit about string theory now. And a lot of people have worked on making these fuzz balls possible. I've listed the names of some of them here, but there are many, many others. So what happens in string theory? In string theory, instead of having point-like particles, you of course still have point-like particles, but you also have what we call extended objects like strings, brains, and so on. If we just have a theory of particles, then you just get a normal black hole. We've talked about that. If you have a theory of strings and brains, does it actually make this black hole? We can ask that question because in string theory, we have to make a black hole with the objects which are present in the theory. If we have strings and brains, what we have to do, we have to make a bound set of strings and brains and see if we get this kind of a black hole. If we get it, we have the same puzzles. So the other advantage in string theory is that the coupling constant, which is like the strength of gravity, it's actually a tunable parameter. In Newton's gravity, G is just a fixed number, but you can here, you can tune the gravitational constant to make it small or big compared to the fundamental length scale which you get from the tension of the string. So you can start with some strings and brains at strong coupling, a small coupling. As there's, there's no coupling, there's not much gravity around, so you just get a bound state of objects in weakly coupled space. You're not even thinking about gravity. Just have a bound state of strings and brains. You can explore that and you will get some object like that. And you might think its size will be order Planck length because that's the typical fundamental scale you get in gravity. It will actually be more like string length but it hardly makes a difference. But now suppose you start increasing the coupling so that gravity becomes more and more important, as important as it is in the real world around us. And then you would think you should get a black hole. If you had lots of these particles in here, in the bound state, if you switched off the gravity coupling, there would be no curvature, there would be no black hole. But now let's increase the coupling till the value we actually have in the real world. Imagine increasing it, and then we expect a black hole. So what do we expect? We expect the gravitational attraction will go up to some distance, where you know, the light cones will turn over. And you remember the radius went like two gm by c squared. So if I increase the coupling g, the radius coupling g, the radius where this happens becomes bigger and bigger. If the bound state stays of size Planck length or string length, the horizon will come up there. And then all this region will be empty space with only gravity here. And I'll be back in my puzzle. However, when we start doing this with string theory, we find a surprise. We, at weak coupling, we have something a bunch of strings and brains whose size is just plank length or string length, something small. But as we increase the coupling, 
the boundary doesn't stay small and therefore does not create this whole domain of just pure gravity around it with the light cone structure we expect from classical mechanics from the classical physics of general relativity actually the boundary starts expanding in size when we increase the coupling so strings and brains when you make a bound state the size of the bound state grows with the coupling and somehow as you increase the coupling you find the horizon radius is growing because r was 2 gm by c square but the bound state size is also growing and the way they grow the bound state is always of order or slightly bigger than the size of the horizon so here is a calculation done long back in to make an estimate of this uh, size and you don't have to know what these parameters are these are different numbers of brains and sizes of various parameters in string theory but g here is the coupling and you can see that diameter d of this object is growing with the coupling to some certain power and if you actually find the radius of the horizon of a black hole with the same mass you find that two are exactly the same order you can see there are so many parameters in here there are seven different parameters here and if you estimate the size of the bound state for any values of the seven parameters the size of the bound state is some particular combination of these seven parameters a fairly involved combination as you can see but it's the same combination that actually gives you the order of the radius of the black hole so this seems quite remarkable that somehow in string theory you get this thing called the fuzz ball conjecture that maybe a horizon never forms in string theory you take all the strings and brains and you try to take lots of them to make a bound state if you take many of them to think i'll make a big black hole well the diameter of the bound state also increases with the number of particles you put in there if you think you'll make the gravitational coupling strong and therefore make a big horizon well the diameter of the bound state also increases with the amount of coupling you take so somehow whatever you do if you can't squeeze stringy matter into a size less than the horizon radius then you'll never actually end up making what you thought of as a black hole you'll never have a horizon where you can get pair creation you'll never actually have all the puzzles that you that came because of the horizon and there will be no problem so this is the fuzz ball conjecture that the bound states are always bigger than or of order the horizon size and so a horizon never formed in string theory but well, that was only an estimate but since then people have taken very explicit bound states of string theory and actually constructed their wave function explicitly and in every case this has been more than 23 years here uh, every state that people tried you never end up making a horizon and that is that doesn't prove that one day somebody wouldn't find some state which makes the horizon but now so many corners of the possible state of so space of states have been explored that that looks to me extremely unlikely so let's just try to understand what is the kind of structure we have gotten from string theory in classical general relativity the light cone turned over and everything fell inside we kept saying it is so hard to avoid getting a horizon how did we actually end up not getting a horizon in string theory what actually happened here so let's try to explore the geometry this was all just estimates of sizes of brains and so on let's go back to general relativity and ask what changed over there to allow us to get a structure which doesn't have a horizon so first let's look at a rough analogy in 1982 witten described something which he called a bubble of nothing let's get the idea of that by taking a toy model think of minkowski space you know it has three space and one time direction i will only draw one spaced direction uh, for simplicity so here think of this as x but really represents x y z but suppose you have extra dimension like you have in string theory so let me imagine i have one extra dimension x5 you can call it which is drawn like a circle so instead of space this one line i have something like a drinking straw but the extra direction is small then the space time what written found was it was actually unstable to tunneling into a new topology so if you have this drinking straw what you can do is you can pinch it in the middle and break it and then make the two sides such that each side of the straw is smoothly capped off like a cigar and just delete this part of space time so what written found was there was an amplitude for this to have quantum fluctuation which create the pinch and the break and you can actually have a quantum tunneling from here to here he called this a bubble because it's like a hole in space time but this part is not even there in space time space time is only this and this now so this is called tunneling into a bubble of nothing he was of course doing it in three dimensions so let's see what the picture looks like over there and the picture is the following take this room for example cut a hole a ball shaped region in the middle of this room and throw it away it's not going to be part of space time but everywhere in this room over every point i had this extra compact circle which i have called x5 right so it was there everywhere before i did any of this and then you could ask i have the circle over every point if i come to the boundary of this hole where do i go do i just fall into nothing that would not be a good space time but no you don't just fall into nothing what happens is you smoothly close off the cap like this 
So if an ant was crawling on this tube, if it comes here, it won't fall into nothing. It would turn around this cap and go right back. The space time is completely smooth. You come from here, you go right back. Okay, so this is what is called a bubble of nothing. You can have this new topology when you have extra dimensions. If I did not have the extra dimension, if this was just a line, not like a drinking straw, which we get when we have this extra circle on it, then if I come here, I would have an end to space. And you can't certainly have an end to space and just fall into nothing. But if you have a close compact dimension, you can smoothly uh, cap it off. So something like this actually can happen for the black hole. This is, was our picture in three space and one time dimension. This was the radius of the horizon. This was the mass capital M inside. And this was the negative energy particle we placed there, which gave us the problem. For simplicity, let me now start drawing only one line, just a line through this our horizontal axis so I can draw things better. That's the line. Again, the mass M in the middle, the negative energy mass here, the horizon radius is drawn by this marker here. The reason I'm drawing only one line is that now I can use the extra space on my paper to say there's an extra compact dimension over every point. In string theory, you know, string theory lives in 10 dimensions, so there are six extra compact dimensions. Okay, so I'll let me just use one of them right now and say there's an extra compact dimension over here. So then the picture I have is same as before. I have a mass in the center, I have a horizon radius, Inside there I have negative energy particles, but there is everywhere an extra compact circle. So the whole thing is like a drinking straw. Well, if this was the situation, I wouldn't be any better off than before. I have exactly the same problems as before. We have always known about compact dimensions possibly existing all the way back from Kaluza and Klein 1980s. So uh, 1918 was the first time, 1-8, before these ideas came up. Uh, so at that time, these ideas came up. So, you know, compact dimensions don't seem to change anything. You can still get negative energy there, and things are here. Except now a completely different topological structure is possible. Because what you can do is, you can just remove this part of space-time, the part inside the horizon, this was the horizon radius, and just outside the horizon, I can just cap it off smoothly here and here. It's slightly different from the bubble of nothing. There are some extra topological twists here, which can be minus on one side, plus on the other. We call the actual structure Kaluza Klein monopole, anti monopole for the plus and minus, but let's not worry about that right now. But then the whole inside is gone. If I had this situation, you could imagine things are much better for me. Because now I don't have any inside of the horizon to fall into. But then what happened to all the mass which was inside? I'm trying to make an object with a mass m. I should at least have that mass m somewhere, which I started with. And the mass m actually goes into all this curvature. If I curve space time appropriately, that costs energy. So the entire mass of the black hole has gone into creating this curvature of space-time, but the whole insight is not there. So this is what we found, and many people contributed to this. There was a very interesting paper of Rudin Malzinson and Mao that showed this kind of Kaluza Klein monopole and anti-monopole structure. What you find is that if you try to make a bound set of brains in string theory, the bound set always keeps having a size which is bigger than or of the order of the horizon size. If you go back and look at the metric produced by that bound state, and you ask what is that metric, Instead of getting the traditional metric of the black hole, which maybe had all the mass in the middle and then a horizon and stuff like that, what you seem to be getting instead is that you have some, uh, the space time just doesn't have any horizon. All the uh, energy of the black hole has gone into creating these topological objects which cap off the extra dimension in such, such a way that you have a completely smooth space time, but you have no, uh, uh, no horizon and therefore none of the puzzles. So we, the object you get this way, it generally will be very messy, very quantum. I do something very simple here for convenience, but of course, firstly, we should do it in three dimensions. So as you come from different sides, you could have plus somewhere, minus somewhere. But again, the idea is that you never have the inside of a horizon. So we just draw this very roughly and say, let's just draw this whole thing and we call it a fuzzball. But the important thing is there's no horizon. It's a very quantum object. All this is happening at the Planck scale in there. We just do it smooth and classical to show you what was going on. But it's a very quantum messy object. The only thing important is, you never form a horizon. So nothing can fall into the hole because like a normal body, no horizon. So then it just radiates from a surface and not by the creation of entangled pairs and the information paradox is gone. And so this is the first ball conjecture that the, uh, the bound states of brains in string theory, when you go to strong coupling, instead of making a vacuum region with a horizon around it, it just makes these big first balls and they have no horizon. And now that everything is like a star or a planet, there is no possible. So this resolves the information paradox. There's still one more question we should ask, and let's talk about that in the last 15 minutes that we have. 
This seems to solve all the puzzles. But how did we get such a big change in our classical physics? The black hole was 10 to the 8 kilometers in radius for the kind of black holes you get at the center of galaxies. The curvature, the horizon of that was like the curvature here on Earth. We don't see any quantum gravity effects here in this room. Even for solar mass black holes, 3 kilometers in radius, the Planck is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. How did stringy effects ever change the structure so much that the entire black hole interior got changed? So the semi-classical approximation, which is not we normally expect when we think we can ignore quantum gravity, somehow that broke down. So why did it break down? When all the curvatures are so low and all the length scales involved seem to be so long, why does semi-classical approximation break down and quantum gravity in the form of string theory come back and influence us in such a drastic way? So let's talk about the breakdown of the semi-classical approximation. So we have seen the football construction seems to solve the puzzle. You can draw the football some schematic way or just down here. But if a star collapses, normal classical physics seems to suggest that you, uh, you know, just get the normal black hole and then you get pre creation. How does semi-classical physics go wrong? Let's recall the work of Bekenstein, who told us that a black hole has a huge number of states. Okay, this is very large compared to the number of states of normal matter, the same energy. And then you find that something interesting happens. We are actually going to make use of this entropy to see how we get new physics where quantum gravity becomes important even to such a large classical system. So consider this star which is collapsing now under its gravity to make a black hole. There's a small probability, a tunneling probability, that instead of actually going along its path of shrinking, it actually transitions and tunnels into one of these false balls. Now, the probability will be very small because for something very big to tunnel into something else very big, the probability will be small because normally small things tunnel to small things. This is something tunneling is a very well known phenomenon in quantum mechanics, but normally happens at the atomic scale. It's a microscopic phenomenon. But tunneling amplitude here will always be still be non zero, it's just going to be small. Okay, if it is small, why are we even thinking about it? As we said, if you're trying to run into a wall, there's always some tunnel to the other. But the probability is so low, that's not the way you try to get through a wall. So we normally ignore this tunneling probability for a macroscopic object. Is there something special about a black hole that we should not ignore it and think about it? Well, a black hole has an enormous entropy, so it has a large number of possible states, all the different shapes of the fuzz ball. So there's some probability to tunnel to this fuzz ball, some probability to tunnel to this fuzz ball, some to this fuzz ball, some to the next fuzz ball, and so on. So it's possible that the probability to tunnel to any one fuzz ball is very small. But I should multiply by the number of possible fuzz balls I can tunnel to. In quantum field theory, you always compute the probability to go to one final state, but then you multiply by the number of possible final states. So let's do that. But the number of possible final states is given by e to the power s, where s is the entropy of the black hole. And that's a very big number. So it's possible that the small probability of tunneling to any one fuzz ball is compensated by the large number of fuzz balls, and the total tunneling probability becomes order one. So that instead of shrinking to a black hole, you actually get some linear combination of all these fuzz balls instead. So let's see how that works out. As a toy model, if you want to think about what I was just saying, suppose you have a particle which you have placed in a box. So this is the wave function of the particle, and this is a box. And suppose it is very hard to tunnel into a neighboring box, but you can tunnel. And if it goes there, this is the wave function you get. But the probability is small, let's say 0 0.01. But suppose there are 100 different neighboring boxes you can tunnel to. Then the probability is only one person to tunnel to any one of them, but there are 100 boxes. So probability to actually tunnel to one of them to somewhere and just disappear from the central box, that can become all the unity. So if you have so many boxes you can tunnel to, even though the probability to tunnel to any one of them becomes is small, if you leave a particle here, in a short time you'll see the particle has disappeared from here. It has actually become a linear combination of everything in the surrounding boxes. So this is a quantum mechanical toy model you can make and check the kind of physics which I'm just talking about. For people who know general relativity, here's one slide which shows you how these two effects actually compensate. The tunneling probability is computed by taking a tunneling amplitude and taking the mod square. The amplitude for tunneling is given by e to the minus a classical action for tunneling. And the action for tunneling, you can estimate by taking the gravity action, the Einstein action, and estimating its magnitude. So you know the Einstein action is 1 over 16 pi g, integral r d 4 x root minus g. I'm not caring about 16 pi and so on. And for all length scales, let me say they are of the order of gm. You know, 2 gm was the horizon radius. I'm not even keeping factor of order 2. c is 1 for now. h bar is 1 for now. So I have the 1 over g from here. 
The curvature scalar has units of 1 over length squared. All my lengths, I'm putting order gm, so I put that here. The volume of space-time, which I'm using for my tunneling process, again, the same length scale to the power 4. I do all that, I find okay, 1 power of g, 2 powers of m. If you go back and see what uh, the number of states was, I should multiply the e to the minus s total mod squared with the e to the s Bekenstein. If you go to what s Bekenstein was, and you put c equal to 1, h bar equal to 1, you find it is e to the plus gm squared. Again, we're not doing factors of order one, but the suppression was like e to the minus some number times gm squared, and the enhancement factor because of large number of possible states is e to the plus gm squared. As now you see, something very unique happens for the black hole, which doesn't happen, for example, for a star. A star also has a big mass, so tunneling would be very suppressed to some other kind of star planet if you wanted to try. But the enhancement from the entropy would be nowhere near as big. It's only black holes which have this very big entropy. But when you have this big entropy, you can see that the suppression of tunneling can be cancelled by the number of states that you can tunnel to. So in fact, black holes are very, very quantum mechanical objects. If you're familiar with path integrals, you can see the same lesson in terms of path integrals. In the path integral, you have a measure term and a classical action divided by h bar. And normally, if you take the classical limit, which you have for a very massive object, the action is very big. You end up extremizing this the measure is one order of h bar lower. You sort of ignore the measure. If you extremize the classical action, you recover the classical limit of physics. But what you're finding for black holes is that even though the action is very big, it's a very macroscopic object, the measure, it basically counts the number of possible paths that contribute to the path integral. That is somehow depending on the measure, which is the number of states which contribute to the path integral, and that corresponds to the entropy which you have in the system. So this is a measure of entropy. If the entropy is so big, what we are seeing is the measure term actually competes with the action term. So you cannot actually take the normal classical limit of this path integral, even though the black hole looks big. In the classical limit, you ignore the measure and extremize only the action. But if the measure term is exactly the same order as the, uh, as the exponential term, then you can't do that. And so the black hole is not a classical object at all, even though it is so very big. So the point is the entropy is also somehow order the measure is also the entropy is order one over h bar. So the measure term also becomes like a classical number upon h bar. And so this thing s over h bar, the action and the entropy terms, they actually become the same order. Here, this s was the action, not to be confused with the entropy. I should have used a different script s maybe. But the point was these two were are actually comparable. So Samir, yes. uh, when uh, we compute this gravitational path integral. So like uh, we have to take care of the saddle point uh, approximation or something like that, because like we really don't know, like, uh, so you know that what I actually want to ask. Yeah, good. That's exactly the point I was trying to make. When you normally are trying to look for a classical limit of some system, you try to hope that the saddle point approximation will work. And when does it work? It works if the uh, exponent here, this mm -hmm. is the one that dominates the entire action. So you extremize the S, whenever S is minimized, you say that's my saddle point, that's the only thing which contributes. True. Of course, small fluctuations about the extremum are contained in the action of the measure. Exactly. So, so but what is happening is the measure term is too big. Then actually the extremizing just near the extremizing of this S is not going to help because this term is not a subleading term. Extremizing this does not give a good estimate for the calculation of the left-hand side because mm -hmm. the contribution of this is as big as this. So the fluctuations are as big as whatever you were getting from the peak. So there's no point in extremizing the S. So it's exactly the classical limit obtained by trying to take a saddle point. That's the part that did not work. Ah, uh, okay. okay. So yeah. that's the lesson. The black hole is not a semi-classical object. The entropy is so large that the measure term and the exponential term are comparable. The black hole is not a semi-classical object. And uh, so the things don't work. So people have done many calculations about this, and you can go check the simple cases that you get this thing called entropy enhanced tunneling. There's so much entropy there that helps you to you know, overcome the classical barriers and have tunneling where you may not have expected tunneling. Okay, so let's summarize everything. We have gone through so many different ideas. What have we learned in this entire process? The first thing we learned was that classical physics says that if you have a large ball of matter, it will collapse to a black hole. And this fact remains true in semi-classical physics. Like you put small quantum fluctuations, which Hawking did, you know, you still get a black hole. Even perturbative string theory, string will also fall in, you still get a black hole. So you get black hole. That's the first step. Then, second step, Hawking showed that such black holes will radiate by the creation of entangled pairs at the horizon, and this leads to the information paradox. 
Okay, so that also, if you have this black hole, semi-classical physics suppose that is valid, this is what you get. Then we learned that thermodynamics arguments tell us that black holes have a large but definite value of the entropy given by this A over 4G. You can think of the A over 4G roughly as the area of the horizon measured in units of Planck length squared. You can imagine how big this entropy is. Solar mass radius of three kilometers. Imagine three kilometers squared. That much is the area of this black hole. Planck length squared. Planck length 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So make a little placket of size 10 to the minus 33 centimeters by 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Divide into that many squares, and that ratio uh, is the actual entropy. It's a huge number. But if you try to use a semi classical picture of the black hole, you have puzzles. You don't actually get this answer. The hole itself seems to have zero entropy because black holes have no hair, it has a unique state. But if you start putting matter into it, you can actually get this bags of gold problem, which I was talking about, that you can put an arbitrary amount of entropy inside. So the entropy thing was very puzzling. Now you have all these puzzles, but when you come to string theory, then a large body of work with trying to make boundary of strings and brains shows that actually you never get into this black hole kind of structure at all. You try to make a boundary of brains and strings, the boundary always has a big size. It sort of grows with the number of brains and the coupling. It never actually shrinks inside its horizon. And so then you, if you can never actually make a black hole, you always get something like what you could call a string star. You have planets, you have stars, you can make a string star, like neutron stars. But you never actually get a black hole. Okay, so this is all the information found out. Just like you have you know, gas stars, you have neutron stars, you have white dwarfs, neutron stars, compress further, you get a string star. You never actually get anything which is conceptually different. It radiates from its surface, and so you just have the fuzz balls, there's no puzzle. Then the important point we noted at the end, the semi classical approximation is violated because of the very large entropy of the black hole. So we might say the entropy puzzle was very important to solving the information puzzle. Because of the large entropy, we could violate the semi-classical physics and change the whole black hole into a fuzz ball. And you can say that because we solved the information puzzle, we found all these states here, then we resolve the entropy puzzle because now these are the states. You count them, that is the entropy. So it's not like there's nothing to count, like we thought with black holes have no hair. It's also not like put infinitely many things in because there's no place there to put negative energy particles. These states are, they are like, just like planet has a fine number of states or a star has a fine number of states. These things also have a fine number. States. So in the end, let's just talk about what's the deep lesson we have learned about quantum gravity. We said this right in the beginning of the talk. The only length scale that we can make out of the fundamental quantities C, H bar, and G is the Planck length. And that is very small. So then you might have thought that all quantum gravity effects should only happen once you get down to the Planck scale. And in some sense, that is true. If you take two gravitons and scatter them, then if the wavelength is much longer than Planck length, quantum gravity will not come in. You can just scatter them using semi-classical physics. Once the wavelength starts becoming smaller than Planck length, then quantum gravity effect like string theory effects will start. But the black hole is not made of just two quanta, which you might scatter. A black hole, especially if it is big, it's made of a very large number n of elementary quanta. So n is a dimensionless number. So now you have to ask a fundamental question. You have only three dimensionless quantities in fundamental physics, C, H bar, and G. But now you have another dimensionless number n, the number of particles which make the black hole. And now if somebody asks you what's the length scale over which quantum gravity operates, it's no longer justified to immediately say, hey, it must be of this order because this is the only length scale I can make of h bar g and c. C, h bar and g. So the point is once you have an n, the length scale you get for effective effects out there could be some power of n times the Planck length. And in fact, what we are finding in string theory is that indeed it is some power of n times the Planck length and the power is such that the physics acts over the horizon scale. So this is a very deep lesson. We always thought that quantum gravities will act on the Planck length, but when a large number of quanta are involved, they can act in a coherent way with each other and produce new length scales. For example, in superconductivity, you have a new length scale coming from the size of Cooper pairs, which is of the order of a thousand atomic diameters. Normally you might have thought all the physics would be the scale of atomic diameter because that's the only length scale there, but that's not the case. So new length scales can emerge. And here we are finding the length scale which emerges is some power of the number of quanta times the Planck length, doesn't matter how big a black hole you try to make, if you make n bigger, the quantum gravity effect at even bigger length scales. So you never end up making an object if you go inside its horizon, the quantum gravity always makes it slightly bigger than its horizon. Okay, this is my last slide up here. So what do we do with all this in the future? We have solved the information puzzle, but in the process we have learned that whenever you have a large number of particles densely packed together, they can create non-trivial quantum gravity effects over macroscopic length scales. Where else do you find such a situation? 
as you go back to early times towards the Big Bang, today we see radiation. Before that, today we see like dust here. Before that, we saw radiation. If you go further back to the past, maybe you had a gas of strains. Further back, maybe you had a gas of brains. What do we see if we go even closer to the Big Bang? It should be very hot. All these strings should be involved somehow. There are some very interesting things we can learn about this from first principles work with uh, gravity. And one is that there's a uni universal equation of state which seems to be emerging. This is a work of a lot of people. And the equation of state says that the entropy density is square root of rho over g. A very simple and basic equation of state. And that seems to emerge automatically when you go to very high densities. And somehow this physics involves deeply the physics of black holes. This formula is very closely connected to the physics of black holes. And somehow this may be telling us what kind of physics might actually be dominating the Big Bang. You can see in a similar way, it's very similar to the black hole. The classical collapse of a black hole is very similar to the dust, uh, dust universe, which followed back in time, looks like a collapsing uh, thing. So if you just take t to minus t, reverse direction of time, black hole collapse looks like following the universe back towards the Big Bang. So they are very similar problems. And if we have learned so many new things about the black hole and how quantum gravity effects become important there, and we have solved all the puzzles there, I think the next thing to do is to go back to the Big Bang and try to work with cosmology and see if we can resolve all the deep puzzles that we are finding with cosmology today. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Mathur, for giving such an excellent uh, overview of the subject. It is very helpful. I truly believe that everybody will be benefited out of that. So I would request all the participants, please unmute yourself and ask questions. And just before that, uh, please give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk. Now, please ask questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I, I'm Alessandro from Florence in Italy. I yes. would ask a question. What, what, what do you think about the page curve? Uh, the, how the fa the Fadwell conjecture solve this uh, solve solve the the new information paradox? Uh, I mean uh, the page curve and the, the uh, what 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 uh, I, I know. If you I you I, as you know, there is the the Iceland conjecture that uh, can recover the page curve. What oh, about which conjecture? These, uh, can you repeat that word? Which conjecture? The uh, island conjecture. Island. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that uh, the replica worm also uh, this recent uh, recent paper that uh, seems to 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 recover the page curve the page curve. And what about the fastball? And uh, can you can you say something about it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked about that. For people who may not be familiar with this, there were some papers recently which tried to argue that using ideas connected to wormholes, uh, you can resolve, have an alternative resolution of the information paradox. So actually, I think that whole path of thinking is incorrect. I am not in favor of that way of thinking. What the island calculation itself does is that it actually reproduces the old work which led to the core idea of remnants. Calculation-wise, it is actually not new because they are not actually using any string theory in that calculation. They actually just do deal with two dimensional gravity plus free scalar fields. So that is just the old setup which was used, for example, in the CGHS model in the mid eight, early 90s. So there is no new physics being put in. And so the answer they get is also the same that the radiation which comes out in that approximation is entangled with the radiation which is left inside. So up to there, you are still exactly at the same place that you have the uh, remnants kind of scenario where the information is uh, the. Uh, uh, quanta inside are entangled with the quanta outside. But what they try to argue after that is that this is okay because whenever two things are entangled, you should imagine that they are connected by a long wormhole. Now, once they're connected by a wormhole, then they argue that in some sense, you can extract that information when you want by doing operations on the radiation, which is far outside. If you do complicated operations on that radiation, you can somehow use this wormhole, extract that information, bring it out. So right now it is not outside. But by doing operations through the wormhole, you can actually bring it out. And that is the resolution of the paradox they would like to propose. Okay. So the island conjecture itself doesn't tell you anything because if you just look at the calculation of what you actually get, 
you don't actually get the page curve from the actual calculation. You still get the entanglement between the inside and the outside just keeps growing. But what they call the page curve is the fact that what they say is the way you define the entropy of the radiation or the entanglement of the radiation, that should be changed. Because they say that because a wormhole connects the radiation to the quanta inside the black hole, you should think of the radiation and the quanta inside the black hole as one common system. Now, if you think of the radiation and the inside of the black hole as one system, then together this system has no entanglement with anything else. So you change the definition of the problem. What you were calling the radiation, the problem was it was highly entangled with what was left inside the black hole. But now they are saying that you should think of the radiation and the quanta which are inside, which are called quanta sitting on the island. The island is just the part inside the black hole. Think of them as one system. And then the whole system, of course, is not entangled with anything else. The two parts are just entangled with each other. And then you say, okay, so now I don't have any entanglement. And so I have recovered the page curve. But physics-wise, if you ask what is then the resolution of the puzzle, like what happened to the information, you have to say that the one hole connects the outside to the inside, and that is how you will get the information out. So I'm not so much in favor of that because I have not actually been able to see any construction in string theory that actually gives such a one hole. Because every time we try to make any structure in string theory with brains and so on, we always got a one hole. So the one hole thing is a little far out for me, and uh, even though I've studied those papers, I don't think it's the right direction. Let me see if that answered anything you were asking, but otherwise, please follow up with your question. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, but in in your um, in, with the fastball conjecture, we don't we, don't, we uh, are not we able to recover to, to recover the page curve. Yes, we automatically get the page curve with the with right. this. There is no problem because this is now like a piece of coal which is evaporating. So once you are not actually creating entangled okay. pairs. You will automatically okay, so that is not, there is not entanglement. So there is, we don't we don't think about we don't think about a page curve. Yeah, because uh, we think about it, but it is as obvious as for any okay. star or any planet. It is not Sim a simply the radiation of a piece of coal, and so that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very. Much. Any more question for the speaker? Please ask. Please unmute yourself Hi. and ask. I have a question. Yeah, please ask. So basically, so in the string theory setup, you are telling there is no black hole kind of structure with any horizon. Then how we can uh, explain the black hole kind of structure we see in our universe? Like there is no light coming out, that kind of stuff. Like, are you feeling that those things are not really black hole with any horizon, but just some kind of massive objects? Yes. So what happens is what you see in the sky, we only see physics which is outside the horizon. We never see any physics in our observations from what is happening close to or inside the horizon. And the reason is very simple. Actually, the, we don't even see anything near the horizon. We only see things which are roughly three times the radius of the horizon. And the point is that if you actually send a light ray which is like closer than some particular distance from the black hole, then the light ray instead of grazing the black hole and coming out, it actually spirals inside. So a light ray actually cannot come close to the horizon and then come out to us as an observer. If it comes sufficiently close, it will actually go in. So if it comes closer than 6m, the last stable orbit, as they call it, will actually be absorbed and go inside. If the black hole is rotating, you can come closer to the horizon, but still, depending on the amount of rotation, no, if you come closer than something to the horizon, it will actually be sucked in. So we never actually see the behavior of anything very close to the horizon. Even when you they say they see the event horizon telescope, you don't actually see the event horizon. You're seeing light which is coming from things behind the black hole, bending near the black hole, but passing quite far from it. Because if it came very close to it, like you know, within 1.1 times the horizon radius, it will actually get spiraled in. So that is what we actually see. And if you see things like gravitational waves or something, then if a black hole merge is taking place, all the part of the gravitational wave that goes inside the radius 6m, which is three times the Schwarzschild radius, it just goes in. So the only part you are using in the calculation of gravitational waves is that you have to have an absorptive object. Anything that goes inside the radius 6m, then keeps going. Now, if you have a horizon, it will go in and fall in and disappear. That is in the classical picture. If you have a fuzzball, a fuzzball has so many degrees of freedom because it has a large entropy, it is very absorptive. If everything falls onto it and gets absorbed, as far as the outside person is concerned, it's exactly the same. 
So if the reflection is like one part in 10 to the 1 million or something, which will happen because the entropy is so big. When the entropy of something is very big, it's very absorptive. Right? So why is a piece of coal black? Because the light falls on it, there are so many degrees of freedom inside it, it will have so much entropy, the light prefers to bounce inside the coal rather than come back. Right? So whenever something has a high entropy, it is absorbed. That's why coal is black. So black holes, even with fuzzballs, will be absorbed into one part in like millions and millions. You will never see any different from the normal horizon physics, which is saying the full wave gets absorbed. Here, it's absorbed to 99.99%. It's the same physics. So observations will not be able to distinguish the fuzzballs so easily. So the part where I think we will see this fuzzball physics is these days I'm working with trying to put the same ideas in cosmology. And in cosmology, we have many puzzles. Like, you know, what is the inflaton? How did we get inflation from there? What is the dark energy we see today? And I think all those are acting on the scale, like the dark energy puzzle is on the scale of the horizon. So I think we will learn something by putting these ideas in the context of cosmology, where actually we can observe things. In cosmology, we can somehow say we are inside the horizon. So somehow we can see horizon physics from inside. So looking around, we should be able to see the same physics, but we are conjecturing here in cosmology somehow. And uh, that's where I think it will be easier to observe them from a black hole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Please ask. Is there any more question for the speaker? Hello, Professor. Yes. Please My only one. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, so I have just one question. Is there, uh, you talked about string theory, we're trying to tackle this problem of uh, information paradox, but is there any other quantum gravity theory that try to tackle this problem? Let's say, for example, quantum loop gravity or something else. So yes, if you do not take string theory, everything to do with fuzzballs is connected to string theory because fuzzballs are an explicit construction. String theory has very rigid rules. All the couplings are fixed, the masses of brains are fixed, tensions are fixed, everything is fixed. So we just have to do the calculation and see what we get. If we get a black hole with horizon, we have the problem. If we get the fuzzball, we get the fuzzball. So we have no choice. We just have to calculate and see what we get. In other theories where you have the strings, they have their own rules and they will have their own answers. So in the work with loop quantum gravity, the model I have seen put out by Ashtaker and some other people, it is closer to a what is called a leaking remnant, a slow leaking remnant. So first the black hole forms, the radiation comes out, but that radiation is still entangled. It does not carry information. But then once you have this remnant, then the remnant can leak energy very slowly over a very long time in very long, low wavelength, long wavelength quanta, low energy quanta. And that's how the information comes out over a much longer time. So the Penrose diagram they draw are like that. Okay. So yes, in different theories of gravity, you will have different resolutions of the paradox. So the wormhole picture says that you will have wormholes everywhere and information comes out non-locally. So very, very non-local physics is required, right? Uh, in the first ball, everything is local, but it's basically just the property of strings which are doing it. In loop quantum gravity, you make a remnant and you slowly leak the energy. So it's different in different theories. Okay, thank you very much. Any further question for the speaker? Sir? Yes. Hello. Yes, so right. how Please these uh, fuzzballs are related to the trap surfaces if the black hole is it uh, much smaller any relation can uh, between them no that's a good question so the point we are trying to make also in the concept context of cosmology these days is that any time that a closed trapped surface is trying to form in a theory of gravity from the classical viewpoint actually the fuzzball physics takes over and prevents the formation of a closed trap surface once you make a closed trapped surface, even string theory cannot help you. Because inside a closed trapped surface, you get the picture I was drawing before, the light cones point inwards. Once they point inwards, even string theory satisfies causality. Doesn't matter what stringy matter I have, it will keep going to a smaller radii, it will go to zero, it will clean out the inside of the horizon, I cannot get any structure there. So once you form a closed trapped surface, all the theorems of Hawking and Penrose, which tell you that you have to keep squeezing to the center and get a singularity, they are valid in any theory with causality and string theory also respects causality as far as I believe. With wormholes and all, you can violate that, but let me not go into that right now. I think string theory has never shown us an actual violation of causality in any calculation. So what is happening is that when a closed trap surface is about to happen, that is when the first of all, uh, this balance of entropy versus this thing takes over and that is when the first balls form instead. 
So you shouldn't get closed tab surfaces forming in the theory. You did form a closed tab surface. Causality forces all the other problems that we were having with black holes all these years anyway. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Any further question? This will be the last question. I will not allow more than that. Uh, hi, uh, uh, hi, Samir. Uh, so, so do fuzzballs have any implications on the uh, holography principle? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think holography by itself in its original form was a good and correct prescription. But I think what happened was that people took holography to a level which was wrong. So I think what happened was in the whole wormhole picture, the reason that arose is that holography suggested the following idea. If you have lots of brains, you can, and some particle falls on the brains, a string falls on some brains, then in string theory, you find breaks into lots of open strings and you get some complicated Yang-Mills dynamics from open strings. But what Malinsana found was, hey, I can replace all those brains, forget those brains, forget those open strings, and just have a simple ADS space instead, where I just see the vacuum and I'm falling in the vacuum. So that suggests the idea that whenever anything very complicated with lots of degrees of freedom are there, you can somehow replace it by just empty space and get simple gravitational dynamics. And in the ADS CFT case, this was correct. Now it doesn't, so that might suggest to you that if you have a black hole horizon, we need to have lots of entropy there, lots of degrees of freedom there, okay? But then maybe there is some other way of thinking of those degrees of freedom so that it actually looks like smooth empty space and there is nothing there. Maybe there's some other way of, other variables where it looks like empty space. And I think this is a mistake because in black holes, you have a large amount of entropy and the size of this horizon actually comes from the amount of entropy in it. In the old ADS CFT case, you started with D3 brains in the vacuum, if you, in the ground state. So there was just one state, there was no entropy. So as long as you're dealing with the area where you put the boundary far away from the free brains where there is no entropy, you have a vacuum. But if a surface is coming because of the entropy, at that kind of surface, I think you cannot use the idea that I should be able to replace it by the vacuum because entropy means you have that many orthogonal states. If you replace them all by the vacuum, you replace many states by one state, and you have already violated your character. So I think the holography idea cannot be continued to the black hole horizon to say this horizon should be a locally empty space. But Malmsen and others were pushing that idea that we should use holography to, as a general principle, and then forces you to say, okay, then this place is empty, but then I'm entangled with the, you know, with the radiation, and then I will make a wormhole, and I will keep everything smooth. So if you make an effort to keep the black hole horizon smooth, by trying to push the idea of holography deeper and deeper all the way to also work at the black hole horizon, you get forced into non-locality and things which I believe are completely wrong. So I think the holographic idea itself was correct, but all the holography shows you is that for every state in the boundary CFT, there is a fuzzball. So, you know, ADS CFT is correct. One fuzzball, one boundary state, and that's what you get. Uh, if you try to say, no, instead of fuzzball, I have a black hole, then you have to say, okay, the black hole connects to a wormhole to the radiation, and I need that opposite part, and, I think that direction is wrong. Does that help to answer what you were asking? Yes, yes, it does indeed. Thank you. Any more question? I think not. So, <clears throat> so I have to thank you uh, to you for agreeing to this, uh, agreeing to give this excellent talk and uh, we have uh, a better understanding about this idea right now um, i just want to ask one more thing uh, like uh, uh, yeah maybe it is not very appropriate question but i just want to ask uh, like since you talked about uh, various cosmological uh, principles and something like that is there is a possibility to uh, test any signature of this kind of fastball paradigm in three plus one dimension so these days what i'm doing is as i said i was working on cosmology so i'm trying to fit these ideas with uh, what we see in the sky yes. and it is very interesting that when i try to make different models of how the fastball structure should behave some of them actually get constrained by what we see in the sky. Like right now, I don't know how fuzzball matter behaves. I try various conjectures and some are getting I can understand. I can understand. 
Like, so recently yeah. I actually wrote a paper saying three puzzles in cosmology. So there I tried to make analogs of the black hole paradox for cosmology. So once you can make a sharp paradox for cosmology, then you know that you need a solution to something. And so then we know that we have these puzzles in cosmology, which involve quantum gravity in some way. And then we can start thinking how we want to solve them. As long as there's no sharp puzzle, you can say, let's just keep going on with semi-classical cosmology the way we do. But with the black holes, we know when we try to do that, there was a problem. But there's also a problem with cosmology. And so you can get references from that going backwards. But there are definitely puzzles in cosmology that we need to solve at the fundamental level with uh, quantum mechanics and quantum gravity. And once we have those puzzles in front of us, then all this, what we see in the sky and how they interact with these puzzles will guide us towards how to use all this fundamental thinking in the cosmological sense. So here you use uh, the exact co quantum cosmological ideas like uh, the approach followed by Wheeler, DV10, something like that. So you can think about that, but the paradoxes don't require that. The puzzles are much deeper and much simpler. For example, the Hawking paradox was just based on simple ideas like this. And then what I show there is that if you use something as simple as the Birkhoff theorem, which says that physics oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shell is not influenced by the outside of the shell, you can then convert the cosmological situation to the black hole situation. Because if you have a collapsing ball of dust, okay. the whole universe is like a whole dust. If I throw out the outside and restrict to a ball, it looks just like a black hole. If Birkhoff theorem allows me to throw out the outside and I focus on the inside, if I do t to minus t, an expanding universe just looks like a collapsing ball, I have exactly mapped you back to the black hole puzzle. So either the Birkhoff theorem has to break down, which looks like a big thing to ask for, or I have mapped a black hole puzzle to this puzzle. So okay. this way you can create paradoxes in cosmology, and when you try to push them to the logical end, you will find being forced to consider questions in quantum gravity. And okay. then whatever model you make for cosmos, you have to see, can that solve my puzzle over there in the sky? Okay. That kind of approach. Yeah, so it's the, like, a lot of things one can do from this, I think, like, uh, like, uh, yeah, it's kind of an open area. So, yeah. uh, okay. So, uh, I think other people don't have any other question. So, uh, at least give a clap for him. I think you guys give, haven't given because uh, he actually uh, have talked about more than two hours. It's almost two and a half hours. So, I'm, <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> okay, so thank you for your effort and thank you very much for listening. Yeah. This was actually a very wonderful thing, and yeah. I think too so, much I, uh, I, I just suggest the other participants to uh, uh, go out from from the chat. I need to talk uh, to Samir uh, about something. So please. Okay, thank you to everybody for so, listening. So thank you very much again, Professor. I will have to go. So goodbye. Thank you for this very interesting uh, talk. We learned a lot about it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And goodbye. Okay, I think uh, yes. Now nobody is here. Everybody is in waiting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, like, it's really nice. Like, I am very hopeful that uh, you will get. Uh, lot of email from people they will ask more questions and it, it is very helpful for the students I'm, I'm really glad that you make a lot of effort to give the whole picture to all of us and 